that way. I don't know. Half the class isn't here today, but uh, that's okay. Uh, yeah, and we'll focus on uh, who is here and try to get you the best last week and a half I can give you in the next uh, few hours. How to get away with murder, anon, romantic comedies, coronavirus explained. Ooh, Ozarks, Shameless, Kissing Booth 2, Martin Narcos, Narcos, excuse me, Black Mirror, Freud, Boston Trilogy, Shooter, Freud, Extraction, oh, two for Freud. Castlevania, did I say that right? Castlevania. I don't know how to do phonics. Breaking Bad. Ooh, shameless. Oh, Pierce movie. I don't know if the show would get tiresome. Professor, what is it? Uh, what is going to be on the final? The final is going to cover everything since our last exam, which is primarily going to be the last of the pharmacokinetics. And then alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, nicotine, and today's content, which will include stimulants, opiates, maybe a little hallucinogens. <laughs> a lot to cover. Um, and uh, it's breaking on your modules. It says unit four, right? More or less, there's, but there's still a little bit of pharmacokinetics that, that bled over into unit four from the last unit that we didn't quite cover. And I should pull up my iPad. It was a good icebreaker. Uh, go away now. Where I want to go is share screen, iPhone, iPad. I couldn't get my iPad, the uh, high pencil to work, but I finally did. Right. So we have completely looked at everything sort of associated with the, this, this is unit four here, right? We looked at everything associated with the four types of pharmacokinetics and we looked at a lot of examples and things and how that all works. Um, we looked at the schedule of drugs. We've looked at LD50. Right, all of this is our final. It's not cumulative, right? But if you don't know what a cell is or <clears throat> what a cytoskeleton is, you're gonna have trouble with nicotine or, you know, right? so there's some concepts that pull their way through, but the focus is on the exam, it's not on old material, it's on this last unit, right? And today, the movie uh, began looking at actually the cannabinoids and all that, alcohol, and let me go to, Can we take a screenshot at the end? Yeah, absolutely. You did that uh, at the end of the last class. Plus, you can pause the videos. I did put, I believe I put the video. Maybe I never finished. Lord knows. I don't know. I've been so busy. I believe I put the video from last Thursday up into the Zoom as well. So you can always pause the video and screenshot as well. Oh, yeah. I was trying to get to our modules. And I need to do the screen share again. This screen. Oh, this screen. Share. Um, right, so this is our class. And when we were on the nervous system, A little bit of this uh, stuff with the pharmacokinetics, we didn't quite finish it uh, for exam three, so I only examined it a little bit. And we're gonna be looking at more things having to do with the lungs as you do marijuana and nicotine. I review the ciliary escalator. And then when you watch the video on Breath of Life, right, it actually shows that ciliary escalator working, right? And it actually shows things landing on it and it going up uh, and th that's pretty cool. Um, and eating to live, right, with alcohol being absorbed in the digestive tract. So those things that you learn in those two videos on eating to live uh, apply to, you know, the absorption of drugs from your digestive system. So there's a little bit of overlap with this last bit. 
the focus up is on the pharmacokinetics and then moving into um, alcohol, which you guys are doing independently, marijuana, nicotine. And then today I'm going to talk about stimulants and opiates and hopefully some a little bit about hallucinogens. And that'll be a wrap. And so our final will pretty much be uh, this unit four with a little bit of stuff from that, that we haven't quite emphasized yet from the last unit. So that hopefully that answers your question. Did I answer your question? Anybody got any questions? No, you guys have been, I can look on the online. I can see you guys have been into the uh, videos that I posted and been watching them and at least clicked on them. And uh, so if you've got questions about that material, things that came up while you were watching it, uh, you want to know more about, uh, ask about it. This is your chance, especially before the final. And Hey, we're only down about 23. I've had Do you know how many questions on the final? I do not know how many questions will be on the final. But you, it's open. you got your open notes and open book. I've been making them that way. So you'll have that to be able to do. And I've been making the time really plentiful. So I noticed the average time to complete exam three, for example, was... 59 minutes, and I had set it, I think, for 100 minutes of time. So I've been trying to make sure everybody has a, like an abundance of time. And then, of course, people with extended time are getting even more. Um, a study guide for the final. No, you've already got your lecture outlines. Uh, you've already got uh, everything that I've put up. Uh, lecture outlines definitely highlight what's important in all of it. There's things up on Quizlet, but uh, no particular study guide. The final is nothing different than a fourth exam. It's no harder, no easier than any other exam we've had this semester. It won't be, could be a little longer, but only because we've got, we covered a lot of material, but I wanted to try to cover some of this material, even if it was superficially, uh, so that everybody could get exposure to some of these uh, drugs. Uh, I think really why you took the class, is to learn more about each of these drugs. And Any questions on the final? I don't know. Any other questions? Get okay, going with talking about stimulants. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. For the, for the videos that you put up, um, do they correlate with the information in the book? Yes. Or, oh, okay. But I added a lot. I mean, the book uh, wasn't written by a medical doctor. And... Uh, so I definitely bring a lot into it uh, and, and modern, modern studies and things that, that that book, that book's pretty much out of print. So you know, it doesn't know about things that have been done in 2020 and doesn't know about E-Valley disease and things like that are not, in the, um, but they're in the video. And uh, for example, the one that I was just looking at the marijuana and uh, tobacco part one and two this morning, I was listening to them while I was getting ready. So today, let me get my, I got a PowerPoint somewhere here. All right, what happened to my screen? Here we go. I'm going to find <laughs> too many things going on my screen. Realize that. There we go. Just resume controls. There you are. And I almost hit stop recording by accident. Share screen. This one. You guys see a plant? On the screen, 
Yes. 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 Uh, like yeah. a pretty plant with some little, little berries there. Okay. Yeah, a coffee plant? You know what this is? Yeah, it looks like maybe it could be a coffee plant. You know what this is? This is actually not. This is actually a coca plant. Cocaine. And what I wanted to do was what is going on with my that's what I was looking for with my pen. Right? This is actually the, the cocaine uh, plant. And what I wanted to talk about today, and I'm gonna do this with my here. Well, you guys know the universal symbol here for stimulant, right? Something that gets the an action potential going. In this case, these are the drugs that fall into the drug class that we usually call stimulants. For the most part, all of the molecules in this drug class interact with receptors or interact with uh, parts of the cell that the normal excitatory neurotransmitters would normally be interacting with. So they tend to mimic a normal uh, excitatory neurotransmitter. <laughs> I'm writing with my mouse. Right? And especially they mimic the ones that are associated with the part of our nervous system uh, that is involved in, again, with what we call, well, that was weird. I don't know what that just did. Flight or fright, our sympathetic nervous system. Our fright, fight, or fight. Right, when you're in an emergency, then your body has to gear up to run away really fast and long from a danger to you're just scared by something suddenly, or you're gonna have to turn and fight a danger, right? That's gonna gear up the part of your nervous system uh, that's for life and death. And that's what we call this, it's part of your nervous system that, anyways, we call it the sympathetic, but it's not sympathetic. You know, you think like, oh, sympathy for someone. Now, this thing is getting you ready to, to kill somebody or to run away for your life and that kind of thing. And as you imagine, if you're uh, getting ready to fight or run for your life, right, your heartbeat's going to have to be going really fast, right? Your eyes going to need to dilate to, so you can see who you're going to fight or to run away uh, and not trip and fall. And you need to dilate the blood vessels going to your muscles and to your heart and maybe constrict the blood vessels going to your digestive system, right? Because if you just ate a meal and you're about to die, you don't need the calories from that meal. That's for tomorrow. It's going to take eight, 10 hours to digest that, right? A long time. So you don't need any blood flowing into your gut, right? You need to divert that blood to your muscles, to your heart, right? To your brain so you can think and run and fight. And that's what the sympathetic nervous system does. And it turns out these stimulant drugs, such as this one is, again, this is cocaine. Okay, the next slide has the name down already. Uh, these are stimulants, and I'm going to talk about two groups of stimulants today, the cocaine, uh, the drugs that come from cocaine, and the drugs that come from ephedra, or the Malong plant. It could, it's found in some other things. Ephedra. Um, and these are really big stimulants. Drugs that fall into the ephedra class, these would be drugs like methamphetamine, amphetamine, ecstasy. Those are drugs that are in the stimulant class of the ephedras. And the cocaines would be things like cocaine, crack cocaine. There is a slight difference. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Oops, I just accidentally opened the chat window. Now I just accidentally closed the chat window and I don't know how to get it back. If there's something in the chat window, someone's now gonna have to point out to me because I accidentally closed it. Okay, let me advance the slide. It lets me not let me advance. Next. Okay. Right. So actually in the marijuana and the tobacco videos, I was talking about where the active ingredient comes from. Like we saw in tobacco, the molecule nicotine is found in the leaf. But in marijuana, it's found in the flower. 
Well, here's another plant, and in cocaine, the 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 molecule that we're going to think of, the active ingredient in cocaine, is actually also found in the leaf. I've got a really good video that I was trying to see if I could find on the films for those films for on demand that I've been embedding. Uh, that I own the actual VHS, not the VHS, the DVD, and it's on stimulants. And it actually takes one of the segments. It takes you down into the jungle. Uh, in South America and uh, they go to a clandestine uh, factory and they show like how much leaf you need like that you need like uh, barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels of leaves that would then get extracted down to make a small amount of powdered cocaine right so if someone was just eating a leaf or taking a tea from a leaf they're having a very low dose of the drug the less drug you take Right, the less drug that gets into you, the less the amount that's going to get to your brain. Right, the lower addiction. So again, the way you take the drug affects addiction, and also because sometimes the way you take it concentrates it. So like in the case of cocaine, people aren't snorting the leaf. Right, they're taking the extraction from thousands and thousands and thousands of leaves, and they're concentrating all the cocaine molecules, and then they're they're taking a concentrated band of that and smoking it or, or insufflating it, right? So at any rate, this is where it does have flowers, right? Description of some of the flowers. It does have flowers, but the flowers aren't where the medicinal qualities are coming from. The, the cocaine molecule is actually uh, coming from the leaf. And let's go back here. Advance. Uh, Cocaine has actually been around uh, a very long time. It was native to South America originally, so it really wasn't uh, used by the rest of the world until uh, the discovery of uh, this part of the world by, by the Europeans. And when they got here, they obviously found tobacco, and then eventually they also found uh, in South America cocaine. The indigenous people of uh, South America had cocaine trade. They used cocaine uh, in their diets. Uh, it helped with high altitude energy. Um, they ate it every day in tea, or they would crunch it up the leaves like a t chewing tobacco, and they would chew it. And so they had probably some level of dependence uh, on the the cocaine leaves uh, by the time of the European arrival. Um, and some people say that's actually one of the things that uh, led to the easier uh, conquest because the uh, and I don't know how accurate this is. The Professor. Country, yeah. The movie Blow is very, very good. And it comes, it's uh, about, it shows the whole process. Of, of extracting it? Yeah, well, yeah. And it shows how Pablo Escobar, you know, how. Right. The, that's like, but that's like, you know, hundreds of years later. This is like when, yeah. when they first had here with the conquistadors, what they did was they took control of the cocaine leaf in the culture, they took control of it. So the only way you could get cocaine leaf was through working for them. So it was a, it was a quickly a way to sort of enslave a population. Uh, you want to work? We'll give you, uh, we'll give you uh, cocaine leaves at break. We'll give you cocaine leaves at, at night uh, and you can have your coca. Uh, but otherwise they like sort of confiscated it and made it uh, so that they had control of it. And I don't know how accurate that is. I don't know if any of you guys are study uh, like Mexican American studies of uh, ancient studies and things like that. I don't know if you could speak to the veracity of that, but that's what I learned at one time. Uh, of course, we're learning a lot more these days about mm -hmm. the history. But yeah, Matt, in terms of the extraction and, the, and the, then the later drug wars that have happened uh, as a result of cocaine in modern times, but the cocaine has been causing disruption um, back into 1600s antiquity. Um, and who knows, it was a big trade in the new world. So it, it, there may have been drug wars at one time b before the new people arrived, right? Who had control of those leaves at that time. Today, if you go to South America, you can go to a marketplace where there's fruits and vegetables and you'll see bags of coca leaves. You can buy them in the streets. Mm -hmm. and yep. as tea. It's not illegal, but it'd be illegal to bring them back into the United States. Yes. Trisha, do you have a question? Is that a hand going up? You're on mute. Me? No, Patricia Rain. Uh, no, sorry. 
Oh. <laughs> so I can't go up. Sometimes I've got I've got looking at my screen. Most of you guys don't have your trying to keep the screens on. All right. So, anyways, that's co cocaine. We'll take a little closer look at it here in just a second. Uh, once it got people started using it, it it quickly took off in the new world. Uh, the chemists and whatnot that had already sort of been evolving by the 1700s quickly were able to learn how to extract the active ingredient, make powdered cocaine out of it. Um, and so uh, it took off as a stimulant. People didn't know it was necessarily dangerous yet, um, but it gave them energy and uh, they liked it just like they didn't know there was a danger to tobacco. Uh, and here's an actual advertisement uh, for Mariani wine. And uh, Mariani wine, what they did was they combined uh, alcohol and cocaine together in the same beverage. And um, this is actually an actual advertisement uh, letting you know that the, His Holiness, the Pope, uh, also um, enjoys Mariani wine and that he has it in his wine cellar. And it's absolutely, they, they, have, they still have it in the, from what I understand, in the Vatican wine cellar. They still have the Mariani wine. Although I don't think they're, they're, now that they understand that it has cocaine in it, they're not, uh, uh, they probably knew it had cocaine in it, but they didn't understand the, the, the addictive qualities of it and all that. And so it was really common to have it in a, in mixed in as a tonic, right, in different drinks, whether it was mixed in with wines uh, or it was mixed in with uh, sodas, right? So urban legend or not, Coca-Cola gets its name Coca, because it originally had cocaine in it. It was originally, the recipe was made with cocaine. Is that true or false? You know, I'm not sure. It's um, true. It's true, right? And it had cocaine in it up until uh, around the 1920s or so. And then when cocaine was outlawed and put onto the schedule of drugs, um, then they could no longer have it in uh, Coca-Cola. So then they changed the recipe. They still needed a stimulant. And that was one other stimulant I was hoping maybe I could discuss, uh, caffeine. And uh, caffeine, what they did was they had to take the cocaine out of the recipe, but they put in then a, a big dose of caffeine that didn't have all the same effects, but it was not outlawed, right? And that became like the modern day uh, Coca-Cola. Well, <laughs> some, and also they, if there was something when I was reading that they used it because like in uh, medicine, like because it numbs. Yeah, so there had medicinal qualities. It uh -huh. absolutely has uh, on peripheral nerves. If you get directly on a peripheral nerve, it causes the peripheral nerve to go numb. So the molecules, yes. cocaine, modern anesthetics, mm -hmm. uh, Lido. Cane, Mark Cane, uh, Bupivacaine, <laughs> see what they all have in common? Cane. Is there cane? So yeah, the first anesthetic uh, was alcohol, and then we discovered it wasn't good because the LD50 for alcohol was right about <laughs> close to its anesthetic dose. So when you gave the patient the dose that numbed them during surgery, half of them died, oops, from the alcohol overdose, you know, but they were, at least they weren't in pain, right, when they died. Uh, and then of course <laughs> the survival rate from surgery wasn't great. Uh, but cocaine then was discovered when it got brought back with the, with the discovery of the new world, right, back to Europe. And then the chemists extracted it and they began using that as an anesthetic, uh, topical mm -hmm. anesthetic. It worked pretty well, uh, but it didn't have a great half-life it wore off very quickly. And the other problem was across the blood brain barrier, it made the people high and that wasn't necessarily what uh, they were going after. So like these other molecules like lidocaine, marcaine, bupivacaine, they were designed by chemists to not cross the blood brain barrier or to have a difficult time of the brain barrier so they would stay out in the periphery. They would block the nerves that were sending the signal into the brain so you wouldn't feel pain but they wouldn't go into the brain and cause an addiction. They wouldn't go into the brain and, and possibly get you high. You cannot get high from having nerve blocks in your uh, skin, right? So uh, that's why they eventually developed like the modern day anesthetics. And the problem with cocaine was again, because it crossed the blood brain barrier, the LD50 went up 
So again, it wasn't the best anesthetic, uh, but these other molecules became good anesthetics. So yeah, it has, it has anesthetic qualities. And so does an alcohol. I can only imagine what that would be like to drink one of this Vin Mariani. I've never had cocaine. I have had alcohol. I can't, I can't only imagine what that would be like to have the two together in a tonic. Um, but especially for the anesthetic qualities, I'd imagine your mouth must go numb like instantly. You can't probably just feel yourself swallow. Um, and anesthetic, right, means that you lose a uh, loss of feeling. Mm -hmm. No pain in your, like, uh, someone were to squeeze or pinch or uh, move your limbs, right? A loss of feeling. And, you know, we would use anesthetics at the dental office, for example, or on to block your skin. We're going to do surgery. Right? And so here's another beautiful poster for Ven Mariani. Look at her. She's very happy with this French tonic. And here, look at the, it probably doesn't project. I can barely see it here myself. It says, uh, fortifies and refreshes body and brain. So it is a stimulant. So it was causing them to get high and it was causing their fight or flight to go up. So their heart rate's going off and their adrenaline's pumping and you, it would be invigorating because normally alcohol is a depressant with the GABA and its effect on uh, glutamate and GABA. Mm -hmm. Whereas this molecule is pumping up these fight or flight molecules and mimicking these fight or flight molecules and actually causing your body to release more of them. So you're being flooded with them and you're being flooded with even more dopamine. You have all the dopamine flood of the alcohol and then the dopamine flood of this cocaine. I can only imagine what this was like. Um, and anyways, then, and even, you know, his holiness, right? Even his holiness, the Pope. <laughs> the fact that the Pope wasn't, they could use the Pope in an advertisement. He's happy. Okay, so the, that's the cocaine molecule, and uh, it's today. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but like today, it's really um, most people would take it. Let me. Let me see if I can project over to my iPad for a minute. I think I opened up the wrong PowerPoint, and so, <laughs> under the interest of time. I will share my iPad. Let me look in the chat because I my chat window was I accidentally closed it at one point and I couldn't get to it. I'm sharing. I need a cocoa leaves and to help me with the high altitude. Yeah, true. Right. So um we're the only ones does the cocoa leaf it's not a candy, it's just like a tea leaf. Uh and it does have the same effects, but you're getting a much lower dose. Some of it's going through the liver and being broken down before it ever gets to the brain. So the psychoactive effects are going to be a lot less. You'll, you'll feel a little bit more energy. But when you first get to altitude, you know, <laughs> you're really suffering from the altitude and you have a very little oxygen getting into your tissues and you're feeling low energy. So uh, at that low dose, um, I don't know, your classmate, did you feel high from it? Who wrote that? I can't tell who needed it. Person who needed it in Peru, did you get, uh, did you uh, feel a high from it really? Or is it just like you could just feel a little less sick from the altitude? Just less, less sick from the altitude. Just less sick from the altitude, yeah. Because yeah. you're getting a much, not that much is crossing the blood brain barrier. So you're not getting the rapid into the brain. The rapid it goes into the brain, you get more dopamine. The faster it goes into your brain, the more dopamine that that nucleus accumbens releases, right? The more nucleus do dopamine and nucleus accumbens, the more reinforcing that is in terms of like, you're gonna do it again and again and again and keep going after that dopamine hit. So, uh, now I was gonna go to screen share. My iPad. And I was going to say something about uh, cocaine. A few more things a little bit about cocaine. It, you can have just the leaf, right, where they can make a tea. 
great. They, you can make a chew. Right, and that's gonna be both, that's gonna be like a mucosal, uh, buccal uh, administration. T obviously is oral, that's gonna be subject to first pass. It was traditionally not really uh, smoked or injected or insufflated, right? It came later after Europeans figured out how to, how to concentrate them, isolate the active ingredient and then figure out how to concentrate it, right? And so modern cocaine like if you on the you buy in streets of America, right? That's been concentrated, and then this stuff can there's a volume of it, and people can um, smoke it, but it's not inhalable in the form that it's in. Uh, tobacco has to be converted from its alkaline form that allows it to be like Native Americans, it wasn't actually smoke. The, the peace pipe actually was more like a cigar. It's absorbed across the mouth. Uh, I'm sure that's not the proper word either for the device that they use. That's like a, probably a really... Uh, inaccurate or whatever, and offensive. Sorry if I just offended somebody. I don't have the right word for the device because um, I'm ignorant, right? But um, the pipe, they would hold the smoke in their mouth, the tobacco smoke in their mouth, and it would absorb across the mucosa. That's the same thing with a cigar. You hold the smoke in your mouth. You're not inhaling it in your lungs. To convert tobacco into an inhalable form, they had to change it from an acid to an alkaline form and to become inhalable. Same thing goes with cocaine. It had to get changed from one from an like acid to a base. It had to get changed to a basic form. Um, and they actually called it freebasing. Um, base is the opposite of an acid. We look on a pH scale, and it took uh, you'd have to take a lot of powder, powdered cocaine, and you have to use some really volatile explosive molecules like uh, ether and things like that. And it often caught on fire and exploded, and it brought down some celebrity planes, I think, in the 70s and 80s, and caught celebrities on fire. I think Richard Pryor got burnt up um, freebasing. I could be wrong about that because I was just a kid, but I. I do believe that that to be true. Someone could verify me if you're on the internet. Um, yes, it was. Know? It was Richard Pryor. And uh, right and then, that was like up until like uh, you know until 1960s, 70s, late 70s. You had to have this lot of technical ability to be able to freebase and to be able to smoke it. So remember, smoking with the inhalation. Now you already got a concentrated amount, so you're getting a high dose. Then you're going to inhale, inhale it, so 90% of it's going to be absorbed, and then it's going to go really rapidly to the brain, right? More of it gets to the brain and faster to the brain than if you had taken it by IV, right? So <laughs> what this did was it suddenly started a drug that had been around for centuries with mild addiction, maybe, like addiction levels like when well, people say they're addicted to coffee, you know, it's not that severe, and suddenly... The people that were freebasing it, they were seeing addictions. Um, the people that were insufflating it also seen addictions because, again, they're taking a much higher dose. The more of it you take, the more of it it gets to your brain. The more of it gets to your brain, the faster it gets to your brain, the more addicting it is. So like, the drug itself is addicting, but the mode of delivery, the way we take it, can make it more addicting. Um, and then only people that could afford a lot of it that had uh, access to all of this could do it. And so not that many population uh, were addicted to it. And then the 1980s came and uh, street chemists figured out that they could take cocaine. And instead of doing this complicated freebasing process that was really flammable, they could do this process where they uh, did chemistry and they mixed it in chemically with actually baking soda. Mm -hmm. And that baking soda is a base. And that effectively changed the, the molecular structure of the molecule. So now it be, could be, you could smoke it again. Right? Because you had to have this, it had to be in this base form in order to be inhaled, in order to be able to have inhalation. 
If it's not in the base form, it can absorb all the mucosa. If it's in the base form, you can inhale it across your lungs. If you try inhaling it in the other form in your lungs, it just goes in your lungs and makes you cough and sick, but it doesn't actually go across. It had to be in this base form. So, and that became known as a crack cocaine. And this process was very inexpensive to do. So they could take like large batches of cocaine and, and uh, what had been insufflated until this point, and then now they could do this process where they can convert it into this crack cocaine, and suddenly the crack cocaine could be smoked. And now it was cheap. So that made it available to the larger percent of the US population, world population. It didn't just affect America. And now it was inhalable, right? So now you could smoke it whatever, it's really a vape, but you could smoke it. And um, now you're gonna get more of it and faster to the brain. And we saw uh, that this was the 1980s. And then the 1980s went into what was known as like a, a crack, a cocaine epidemic. We had a, more people, just like today, more people are dying from all these opiate overdoses. Back then everybody was dying from their uh, cocaine overdoses. And, uh, in high school, put it in perspective, NBA players, I, ma I made a comment on somebody's project. There were NBA players and, um, you know, high level, uh, you know, like March Madness level basketball, uh, college basketball teams, NCAA, um, Division I uh, basketball players, that was the word I was coming up with, Division I basketball players that were uh, dropping dead on basketball courts. People in their prime of health, college level athlete, NBA athlete, they go out and practice or go out on the game and just drop dead. And uh, I remember I was in about junior high and and I was like, why, why are all these basketball players dying? And it was like, oh, co autopsy, it's cocaine, you know? And I was like, oh, and we'll see. One of the things that you can overdose with when it comes to stimulants, So brain, cerebrum, cerebellum, diencephalon, right? Here's where all that dopamine's going off and can make you an addict, right? But then you got that we go down our midbrain, our pons, our medulla. And our brain stem. The signals from here, right, are the ones that are gonna go out and stimulate your heart and tell it when to beat. And what happens is when, when you, for example, were to get scared or you need to fight, right? Or you need to run, what should happen to your heart rate? Stay the same, go up, slow down. I gotta run for my life. Go up. Gotta go up, right? Gotta go up, you just gotta start. And again, the breath of life shows that really well, but it's gotta go up and it's gotta start circulating uh, uh, the oxygen and, and, and removing the waste, right? So that delivering everything to my tissues. So these drugs, they mimic, right? The neurotransmitter that the brainstem normally uses to communicate with the heart to tell it to speed up, which is a molecule called epinephrine. And there's a related molecule called nor epinephrine. I discuss these in chapter 15 of the primer. If you want to go back and look at it, I go into I talk deep into all the neurotransmitters. But it suffice to say, when these neurotransmitters go across this gap, right, and then bind onto the receptor on the heart, they're going to cause the heart, right, to speed up. And stimulants mimic this pathway. So what happens is when someone starts to take these drugs like crack cocaine, cocaine, amphetamine, and it goes in and the cocaine gets into their brain and it gets into their brainstem and it begins to change the, the way and it goes actually gets into their heart as well. And it changes the way it responds and it causes their heart rate to speed up. So it increases, the drug increases the heart rate. And at first, 
that's okay. The heart speeds up, get invigorated, right? You're at high altitude, you feel a little better, the stuff is circulating. But if you take too much drug, this is what happens. The blood, the heart fills with blood between beats. So your heart has to squeeze, that's a beat, and push the blood out. And then there has to be a pause where it's slowly expanding and filling. And then when it finishes expanding, like when you open like a, when you push on like a turkey baster, you squeeze it out, right? The blood goes out and then you release it. And then you, if the tip was in the turkey juice or something, and you open it, right? The juice goes up in. Same thing's happening with our heart. When our heart like dilates, it actually draws in all the blood and that's how it fills. And then it squeezes and pushes it out and then it dilates and fills. So your heart has to beat often enough to keep the blood going. If it beats too quickly, like it beats, pause, beat, pause, beat, right? That's like 72 beats a minute. That's normal. Maybe 100 beats a minute. Beat, pause, beat, pause, beat, pause. It's filling. If it starts going too fast, like 150, 200, 300 beats a minute, what happens is it's just going contract, 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 contract. It's pushing, pushing, pushing. But because it's never pausing, right, that it never fills. And so even though it's contracting, it's not filling with blood. So it's contracting, but there's no blood. So it's actually pumping nothing. Your blood is actually in a standstill in your body. If your heart rate goes too fast, and this is like, it's counter intuitive what you might think, right? Instead of it circulating faster and faster and faster, it reaches a point where it can no longer fill the heart. And now it just comes to a stop. And so if your heart rate goes too fast, your blood stops moving. It stops circulating. And that's a medical emergency. You can't have your blood stop. <laughs> so if your blood stops moving uh, for just 60 seconds and you don't get blood sugar to your brain, your brain cells begin to die without blood in 60 seconds, right? And then in five minutes, you're going to start suffering organ loss. And in 10 minutes, you're going to start suffering brain damage if you can't return it, right? Plus, when your blood stands still, it starts to clot. So even if the heart were to slow down again, now your blood is turned into jello, right? It can't pump it, right? And so that's how most people overdose when they take stimulants. They just got their heart beating too fast and it stops pumping blood. It's going to be the opposite of the opiates, which causes everything to stop going. Um, but they also affect the brainstem. All right, so let me see what I got over my PowerPoint. Where's all my cocaine pictures? Um, I'm going to say a little bit more, I guess, about the, my PowerPoint before I move over. It's just about my, from here, before I move over to PowerPoint. Anybody get any questions? So, just didn't want to advance. I'm having all kinds of technical problems today because it's the last day. All right, so you typically overdose because of a too rapid a heartbeat. And that would be true of all the stimulant uh, drugs and all the stimulants. So whether you're talking about cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine, crack cocaine. Um, the reason crack cocaine is called crack cocaine uh, is it makes no sense is it's sometimes called rock cocaine as well because the original cocaine is like a powdery substance. When they mix it with a baking soda, it becomes like this waxy chunks, which was sometimes called rock, but it was tend to be called crack. Because what happened was when they had these little rocks and they put it in a crack pipe, right, and then they heat it, 
light it with a flame or whatnot, and they heat it, it would begin to evaporate, and it had a very low boiling point, so it, it, it didn't take much for it to, to heat up, and it would almost little explosions as it was heating up, and it would make little cracking so sounds right as you heated it. Right, so it was the crack cocaine, because it was like, <laughs> from what I know. I never used cocaine, so uh, I don't know, but uh, that's what I'm told. And uh, the name kind of stuck. <laughs> so there's it's in this little crack bowl. There we go. Right. So, and the only thing I can think of is like Rice Krispies. You know, snap, crackle, pop. Right. When you pour the milk in, they start to make that popping sound. Right. And that's I think what they were sort of going after when they, you know, named crack cocaine cocaine. But mistake no about it. it it's just cocaine, uh, and uh, it doesn't matter if it's in its acid form or its base form. It's still cocaine. It's still the same molecule. It's still going to mimic the same uh, neurotransmitters and have pretty much the same effect. What made crack cocaine, crack cocaine more dangerous was the fact that you could inhale it. And now you had more getting to the brain and it was getting to the brain faster, just as if you had been almost like injecting it, right? So that's probably what I'm gonna have to say about cocaine for now. The next like stimulant that I want to sort of drop into are the amphetamines. And these come from plants as well. And they originally come from a molecule called ephedra. And then you can chemically modify ephedra. It becomes this molecule called ephedrine. And that can get modified into something called pseudo. Ephedrine. This is um like cold medicine. Uh, it said that these uh, these stimulants they cause some blood vessels to dilate and other blood vessels to constrict. And the if you're trying to get air right in an emergency situation, you would want the blood vessels in your nose to actually constrict, so there's more room. The the tubes are lined with blood vessels. Right, the blood vessels warm the air and whatnot. But if you're in an emergency, you want those blood vessels to shrink back so that the tubes can have room to expand the tubes of your sinus openings and everything so that they can draw more air in. And the same thing if you're sick and your passageways are clogged with, let's say, mucus, if you can shrink back the blood vessels, then there's a little bit more room in the tubes and it frees up your airways for breathing. So uh, scientists in the in around 16 or 1700s, figured out that they could take the plant and they could extract it down and create these cold medicine molecules that today we would call like pseudofed, 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 <laughs> like there's a name for it. Um, and uh, thing is though, from ephedra and ephedrine, we can also create some other pathways of chemistry, right? So we can start with a plant. And in Asia, the plant, there's more than one plant that can have this, probably the most common plant that in history sort of got extracted from. It's like this Mawang plant. Um, I apologize for my accent, it's ridiculously horrible. But it's a herbal plant that's been used in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, for example, as a cold medicine uh, to uh, clear their lungs and, and help with a weak heart, right? Because it would cause increase in heart rate, right? So it's, it's, it was used in traditional uh, Asian oriental medicine. Uh, but then again, European chemists, they get a hold of the plant, right? And we begin extracting things. Right? We go through these extractions, one to the next, the next. We can also extract these molecules that we call Am, oops, amphetamine, you just take the plant, you take the, the molecule ephedra that's in this plant, and you can send it one way on your extractions and you'll end up with cold medicine. You do it another way on your chemically modified as you're extracting it, and you can convert the ephedra into amphetamine. Uh, and they use amphetamines in uh, medicine and Western medicine. Right, the plant was being used in Eastern medicine. 
the amphetamine molecule was being used in Western medicine for the same things, increased heart rate, increased stamina, uh, was being prescribed by doctors. Uh, it was taken orally or it could have been chopped and, and insufflated, but you weren't getting very big doses still, even though it was uh, concentrated. There was an addictions associated with it. Um, but then, oh, for example, World War II, a lot of soldiers uh, in World War II, American soldiers, for example, it was put in their rations. So when they got their, um, uh, their MR, made ready to eat their MRE meals, right? And they'd have chocolate bars and whatever else. There was also amphetamine in there. So if they were tired, they would take the amphetamine pill to help them with marching, help with their fatigue and help with their pain, right? And all that. Um, pilots too. Pilots, yeah. Oh, because especially the ones that had to stay, uh, they would have to muster and stay up for 24 hours and just fly around in their zones. It yes. was really hard to stay awake. Uh, and so it was like sort of normal and uh, Japan was using them. America was using them, and Russia was using them, the Germans was, Hitler was addicted to amphetamine, actually, that's well known. He, he actually injected it. Um, so, I don't know, say what you want, World War II, everybody was on amphetamine, I guess. Um, they say the pilots uh, that would, um, Japanese pilots that would, uh, uh, after their fuel was up and whatnot, then they would drive their planes into, crash their planes into ships, right? Uh, think like Pearl Harbor. Uh, they would uh, give them massive doses of amphetamines before they would take off and it would actually make them, uh, it would get them high. It would give them really big doses. It would make them a little bit um, like super high. Um, it would put them in a euphoric state. And again, when you're in euphoria, you can't do anything wrong. In a euphoric state, you feel no pain. There, there's no mental pain. There's no physical pain. Uh, you absolutely feel like you are the best at everything that you do. So if you're the best at everything you do, uh, you're going to get in that play, you're going to win, right? And uh, you're, you're euphoric and high, so I guess um, the idea of maybe slamming your plane into an, another thing and blowing yourself up, uh, I guess it was easier to accomplish on amphetamines, right? So some of you are history buffs, you can, you can learn about that and uh, see all the different ways that amphetamine played roles in World War II. But speed forward to uh, America 1970s, and we discovered we could do something else with the amphetamine. Our chemists figured out we could modify it slightly and we could put a carbon with a couple uh, hydrogens, they call this a methyl group in chemistry. And they figured out they could take this amphetamine molecule and they could stick the methyl group to it. I'll attach it on. And the chemist chemically modified the molecule and they put this methyl group on and this became known as meth amphetamine. And the thing about methamphetamine was the addition of this methyl group made it uh, easier. It made it more lipophilic and it had an easier time uh, crossing all the cell membranes of the blood brain barrier right? The barrier that's keeping the substances out of your brain, right? The toxic substances out of your brain. So by adding this methyl group, methyl, this methyl group is more lipid-like. And it conveys lipid properties to the molecule. So it crosses the blood-brain barrier with ease. So now you could take the same dose of drug, but now more of it's going to cross the barrier. More of it's going to absorb from your stomach, right? As you made it more lipophilic and it made it a more potent drug. And uh, by the 1990s, we were having a methamphetamine um, epidemic. So the 1980s was all about cocaine. Cocaine was causing problems. And then everybody stopped taking cocaine. And then the 90s came and everybody went on the methamphetamine. And then everybody was on meth, meth. Uh, a lot of you think you've never taken amphetamine because you know that you would never do meth. You never would, you never would have done crystal meth because somebody in your life told you you shouldn't do meth. But you have because you've done MDMA, which is ecstasy. And I got a slide here, which uh, is basically methamphetamine. Um, and uh, probably you did it orally, though. 
So you didn't smoke it. And that was a lot of people smoking. They smoked methamphetamine. Ecstasy tended to be taken orally, although I've seen people smoke it. Um, Molly in the 90s. Um, Excuse everybody me. was all about their Molly. And uh, we'll talk about that as well when we talk about hallucinogens. Uh, MDMA is a weird molecule because it is a stimulant, but it also has hallucinogenic effects. So it has like these dual effects that uh, I was going to sort of maybe talk about it there. And let me show you guys. I want to get my PowerPoint going here. Here we go. Let me stop sharing this and let me um, screen share this. Yeah. So these are the uh, amphetamine, methamphetamine molecules. I'm not going to have them on the test. Like, I'm not going to make you identify them on a test or something. But I wanted to point out, though, nonetheless, some structures here. So this is the this this is the amphetamine molecule, and you see it's got the business end of the molecule is actually this this part right here is the part that's going to actually interact. Uh, uh, so down here in the right lower right hand corner, this is the actual molecule that your body manufactures. Right, this is the endogenous molecule that binds to the receptors that your cells bind to. Right, this is the endogenous molecule. This is the uh, epinephrine molecule. If I had norepinephrine here, it looks uh, almost the same. And the business end is this part right here that's got that weird sort of stop sign looking thing. And if you go and you look at the amphetamine molecule, pick up a better. Uh, up a laser pointer. You look at this business end, here's that little stop sign, right? It's got a little, and then the house here, the shape, the little house. And you'll see all of these have the stop sign with a house, the stop sign with a house, the stop sign with a house. That's actually the part that interacts with the receptor. And if you look at epinephrine, the actual molecule your body has, here it is. This is the, this is the receptor was evolved to interact with its own messenger internally, right? So we evolved to be able to bind this molecule here with this little house shape, right? And then it turns out amphetamine can bind there. Methamphetamine, okay, so here's methamphetamine. Right? So this methyl group, see the CH3? That's if you just attach it right here, you knock off the hydrogen, and then you attach the CH3 here. This has one hydrogen, this has two. Knock one off, so now it's just NH. And then you stick this methyl on. That was the difference between amphetamine and methamphetamine. And that addition of that little methyl group made it much more potent, right? And then uh, MDA, which was uh, sometimes called Adam, uh, the, not really abused as much. But then they figured out they could stick, they could take basically the uh, amphetamine molecule and stick this little group of atoms on. And it became MDA, and it had its own medicinal, it had its uh, own uh, psychoactive effects, and it crossed the blood-brain barrier pretty well. But then they figured out they could take the methamphetamine and put that little hat on it, and that made three, four methyl n dioxy methamphetamine. See, methamphetamine. This is methamphetamine. Same methamphetamine. This is MDMA. That's Molly. That's ecstasy. Here's the ephedrine molecule that comes from the plant. And the pseudoephedrine, they converted, this is from the plant. And then they, you could take the tea of the plant, but then the chemists learned they could make the pseudoephedrine molecule. It's almost the same, except the way I put the red box around it, 
It's just whether that those oxygens are coming towards you or moving away from you in the three dimensional shape of the molecule is the only difference between the plant versus the cold medicine, like Eastern medicine versus Western. But then again, look how similar it is to the actual molecule that your brain is using, the actual endogenous molecule. It's got the same rings, it's got the same, there's the OH, it's got the OH, it's going away, it's going away, it's got this NH. Well, that's a little bit different, but it looks almost the same, right? It's the business end, the same. And that's why they all work in your body. We have endogenous messengers like epinephrine that need to communicate. We can take exogenous, We can take these exogenous molecules and because they look uh, just so similar to the um, original molecule I was gonna try to highlight here, right? This here's our little business end. Oh, I need a different color though. Right, and there it is. This is the same shape here. It's the same shape here. It's the same shape here. Right? There is the ephedrine, that's for like the Mawang plant. There it comes down. Here's the pseudoephedrine, that's like cold medications. Right? All the same molecule. Oh, there's ecstasy. There it is. And so that is why these drugs can are used in our body. Now, some of you might sometimes go to the pharmacy now and pseudoephedrine is totally over the counter. This is an over-the-counter medication. If I have a cold, I know that I can go to the pharmacy and without going to the doctor first, I can go take pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine does not cross the blood bank very, very much, a little bit, but it's got a pretty low LD50, unlike amphetamine and methamphetamine and whatnot that you need a prescription for, right? These drugs are on the schedule and you need a prescription for them. All right, pseudoephedrine isn't, but when you go to the pharmacy and you go to get it, it's not there. You actually have to go back to the pharmacist to get it. And you have to show an ID, even though you don't have to, I don't even think technically you have to be 18 to get it. Maybe you do, they may have changed the rule on that. Why is that? Why is an over-the-counter medication like Tylenol, aspirin, that I should just be able to pick up and not have to talk to anybody? Why do I have to go back and talk to a pharmacist and produce a state ID to get an over-the-counter legal medication. Don't they track it? Because don't some folks use that to make like a- Yes. Yes. Because you can take the, the pseudoephedrine molecule and you can back engineer it, right? You can take it chemically and you can, with very simple ingredients, you can you need a propane and, and some other molecules that you're going to mix with it. The propane has the methyl groups and stuff. And anyways, you can very quickly convert pseudoephedrine into methamphetamine in the 90s, in the early aughts. Uh, they used to call it, they would cook it. They, they were cooking their crystal meth. What they were doing was they were taking the pseudoephedrine, right? And they were converting it to methamphetamine. And some of you listed today when I had that poll up, were you looking what was good in Netflix right now? A couple people put Breaking Bad still as something that's good on Netflix. And it, <laughs> that's exactly what they were doing in Netflix, except that the, instead of taking uh, pseudoephedrine, they ended up getting like the ephedrine imported in in tanks from India, right? And then they were using that molecule and, and uh, they were converting that into the, the blue crystal meth of the, um, the show, right? The show is uh, fiction, but you know, it's based in reality. Um, Funny. Some chemistry, like there really is real chemistry, like you really can take these molecules and you really can turn them into methamphetamine and, you know, but obviously this actual character himself uh, is not like a real person, possibly a composite. I just saw recently some uh, college or high school chemistry teacher just got busted for making uh, meth. Came across my news feed. <laughs> well, because NSA must think I am the biggest drug addict or drug dealer that ever existed. Because as long as there's been internet searches, 
And even before then, when I would have to go to the library, because I, what I teach, I have been Googling and reading articles of like everything about drugs. I'm constantly looking up drugs. I'm constantly downloading articles about drugs. I'm signing into websites, you know, for like drug, for like, uh, uh, learn more about like what, what information's out there, like, you know, from the different societies. So NSA is probably like, man, she's like a must be a drug dealer or she must be. But it's just like, no, it's just research. You don't have one Class. named after you. Pardon? You don't have one named after you. No, not yet. <laughs> but it must be on an NSA file. They're probably like, what's up with this lady? Um, right? So this is um, the amphetamines, right? And again, it's coming from the plant. It's coming from this originally in, in the history. Oh, I guess I've got to go the other way. I really did grab the wrong point. There's different types of amphetamine in the 70s. They would call it like crack and crank uh, or something like that. And, and they were mirror images of each other, the D form and the L form. And they would, they would sometimes mix. You would have pure forms of D or pure forms of L or mixtures of D and L. And um, I forget the exact ratio. The book, the orange book actually talks quite a bit about that because at the time he, he was publishing those editions, that's when when uh, the different versions of methamphetamine, it was before uh, just as ecstasy was coming around. I have to tell you when ecstasy first, ecstasy, can I clear this? I don't know if I have an eraser. Eraser. Ah, there you go. <laughs> so when you look over here, again, this is uh, ecstasy. Let me get the color again. All right, this is ecstasy. And uh, now, after all that erasing, I forgot what I was going to say. Holy Christ. Oh, uh, it, it was not illegal. Ecstasy wasn't even created until like the late 70s, early 80s. And so by the time it sort of made its way into the population, first the FDA has to discover the thing. They have to see that it's causing a problem. They have to see that it's a molecule related to a molecule that's already been, uh, amphetamine was already against the law, methamphetamine was already against the law and so on. And so first it has to be discovered. Then they have to pass the law to say, oh, now this extra molecule is also banned. But there was a time in the 1980s where this molecule was being, people were buying it, like uh, you could get it and uh, it wasn't illegal yet. And I remember I had friends come up to me and go, oh, you should try this new drug. And I go, well, what is it? And I was getting smart enough at this point to know that there were different types of drugs and there were stimulants and depressants. And I was learning about it because I wanted to know what was going on in the world around me. And uh, they're like, oh, it's a new drug. And I'm like, yeah, but what is it? Is it an opiate? Is it a stimulant? Like, I was trying to figure out what's my risk of addiction. I was only about maybe 16. And um, basketball players have been dying from cocaine. And I'm like, you know, what is it? Is it a cocaine? I don't want to take it. I have a mild heart condition that I know I didn't want to take stimulants. And they're like, oh, it's a new drug. It's called ecstasy. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but what is it? And there was no internet, so I couldn't really look it up. And I was just like, you know what? I'm good with that. And um, a lot of my friends that, were, that did it, um, it was weird because they did it and then they would talk about it all the time. And they wanted everybody else to do it and they did it, did it, and did it. And I was like, seems to me, it seems really addictive. And they're like, no, it's not addictive at all, but you should do it. And I love doing it. And my girlfriend and I are doing it and everybody's doing it. And we should all do it. And it's like, but it's not addictive. Sounds like it's addictive. Seems, no, it's perfectly safe. It's legal. So again, just because something at that moment in time, is legal in that moment doesn't mean that it's safe, right? That could just mean that it's new and brand new. We haven't figured out all the dangers, which turns out to be the, the case with, with, uh, with Molly. Um, it does have its medicinal qualities. All of these drugs can be used medically. And uh, MDMA, because of its hallucinogenic effects and its euphoric effects, um, it can be used to treat depression. Um, it can be used in therapy. They, a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists would like it to be moved off the schedule 
uh, down to like from a schedule one down to say like a schedule three or four so they could actually uh, prescribe it and use it in a um, clinical setting not like send you home with a prescription but like you know in a controlled way you know allow you to use it and for um, psychological therapy purposes and um, I think that's what I have to say about that. Any questions? Again, there's that molecule. There's that that Hama Wong plant or the terrible uh, highlighter color. Hey, professor. Yes. Um, what was the when was MDMA? What time frame was that? What, what, what thing? Yeah, the MDMA. Oh. I think it was sort of be, the chemist sort of discovered around the late 70s and and then it really made its way into culture by the 80s. Oh, okay. Because I know it was in my high school in 82, 83. Oh, yeah? Was that like around the disco time? Just, yeah, yeah, probably the disco era preceded it a little bit. I think that was more the mid to late 70s. Uh -huh. I remember. I remember in elementary school uh, the song "Disco Duck" came out. So I imagine it had been around a while. I was in like fourth grade or third grade when "Disco Duck" came out. <laughs> Don't Google it. It's the stupidest song you've ever heard. It was around the time of Studio Fifty Four, right? I think that was nineteen sixties. I don't know. I'm not the best historian, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm really bad with dates. Uh, all right. So let me go next. Okay, I'm fine. This is actually an interesting um, slide. So there was a police officer in, uh, I think it was originally in Indiana, um, and it was around the time when uh, people were beginning to uh, smoke uh, meth, and uh, he was picking people up and busting them and then uh, rearresting them and rearresting them, and he was seeing just in short periods of time from one arrest to another, like really dramatic physical changes. So in his, he started um, with permission, obviously, with the police department. He started uh, cataloging. He was following the same people. First of all, he couldn't believe how, off they, how often they were getting arrested, but how quickly and dramatically they were changing in, in really short amounts of time. And actually, one, a couple of you guys did some, uh, your projects included, not these two images but that I was going to show you guys, but images similar to this. And again, this was a police officer going, we have a serious epidemic, and I, this, thing, this drug is not, is doing stuff to people, right? And meth, when it constricts your blood vessels as a stimulant, it constricts the non-essential blood vessels. And when it does that, it constricts the blood vessels going to the teeth and going to the skin, right? And it causes all kinds of skin and it causes meth mouth where it looks like a bomb goes off in your mouth and all your teeth turn black, your gums and teeth turn black, necrotic, and they die from lack of blood supply. And they just, all your teeth fall out. And the skin, all the collagen, it needs blood supply to, to maintain itself. And so you think this was a long time, uh, the woman on the left to the woman on the right, um, but actually it's not. I think this was just a, just a few years. And um, the next slide I have, this was 10 years, this lady. And when, when she first got arrested, the first couple times he arrested her, she was, this, the quality of this image isn't there. She was like an attractive, normal looking woman, you know, young woman in her, you know, mid twenties, early thirties or something. And by the time, I mean, look at this image down here, but by, by the time uh, 10 years had gone by, uh, she had lost all her teeth. She had lost all her weight. They lose their appetite, right? When you're in a fight or flight moment, your body doesn't need to digest food. If you're gonna be dead five minutes from now, there's no need to digest food. You're gonna be dead. That's, that's again, a meal for eight hours from now, 10 hours from now, those are calories for tomorrow. So in, a, in an emergency, you stop digesting. So when people are abusing these stimulant drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine, amphetamine, it, it knocks out their appetite because the brain tells you don't eat, right? It, it shuts down all the blood supply to the intestines. So they stop eating while they're on these drugs um, and they just like waste away and their skin rots and their teeth rot and their hair falls out. It's just um, really sad actually. Um, I'm sure I have more that I should be saying. I don't know where to look, why I don't have the right PowerPoint slide up. Um, let me take a quick thing. 
also on stimulants, maybe before I, I move on and start getting into uh, opiates, um, let me just say a little bit more about these molecules. When it comes to the stimulants, you're gonna overdose the same way, whether it's amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine, crack cocaine, the D form, the L form, like, it doesn't matter. You're going to overdose the same way. It's going to cause your heart rate to go up. It's going to cause your body to overheat, right? You're not going to be able to pump blood. You, you die the same way from these drugs. Um, unfortunately, metabolites to these drugs, they don't hang around and they don't linger very long. So you could be a pretty active user of say amphetamines, methamphetamines, cocaine, whatnot, and, and you can still pass a drug test, you know, 72 hours later, you can still be passing drug tests. Um, again, whereas like say the marijuana user, um, it, they won't be able to pass for weeks maybe. Alcohol user, it's definitely gonna be in their system the next day, but the two, a day later, it's gonna be gone. Um, these drugs clear the system quite quickly, but they're still very dangerous in the sense of uh, overdosing. Um, I wanted to say something about alcohol when you combine alcohol with cocaine and yeah. in the same day. Yeah. I just muted everybody so that wouldn't pick up. Let me get to this right screen share. Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, it's about exogenous and uh, endogenous molecules. So the endogenous molecules would be what we have in our body, and the exogenous would be the molecules that come in and attach. Is that endogenous, correct? yeah, in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And that's where the endo, meaning it, it's like in, it's coming inside. from within inside of us. It's made Non-exile. inside of our own cells, yeah. And then exogenous was is something you would it, it comes from like a plant or or in a lab somewhere where they chemically manufactured it from just from whatever uh, and yeah that's something that you would then take and then you would put into the body um, and it's coming exogenous it's coming from outside the body originally and then you're putting it in and that's where that comes from so yeah I think you said that correctly okay thank you you got it. Um, I hated chemistry because of those. Looking at the chat window. Yeah, man, people didn't know they can get addicted to stuff. It is sad, but um, to give you an idea of the cocaine. This is actually in our uh, orange book, but you can go on the National Institute of Drug Abuse and the National Institute of uh, Household Survey, which is a few found when you were doing your reports. There's been a trend as far back as we've been able to track it. Um, when we look at cocaine and amphetamines, uh, going back to like the 1700s, and it goes like this. If let's say the blue line is cocaine, the other line are the amphetamine molecules. And what we see is if, the, if you go in history, um, at any given time, when you look at a human population, this is like sociology, it's also epidemiology, we don't abuse them at the same time in history. So let's say in uh, World War II, 1940s, amphetamines were peaking, right? All the soldiers were on the amphetamines, but if you actually looked at that time and saw who, what were people were using, the cocaine use was at its historic low. But if you go back to the 1920s, cocaine use was at an all time high during the roaring 20s, that Vin Mariani, all that stuff was happening in the 20s before it got out loud in Coca Cola. You go, it, it, it'll, it'll, it keeps reversing. You go all the way up, like, you know, speed up in time, you get to something I'm more familiar with. So the 1980s, uh, the 1970s, Uh, the amphetamines were in their peak and cocaine was in its low. 
And then in the 1980s, cocaine use peaked, right? And amphetamine use fell. It's just, it's, it's, uh, when you think about addiction, it's almost like humans, like we, we, we keep taking these, these, these speed drugs, these stimulant drugs, and it's like our memories are short. So like we learn that it's really bad and it devastates the human, humans and we all get addicted and babies get born that way and it's terrible, so we stop using it. But then our memories are short, so we don't remember that just 20 years ago or 30 years ago it was a dangerous drug and then we just, we just flip it and we, we take it again. So if you look at the 1990s, that was when um, amphetamines peaked again um, with uh, ecstasy into the aughts, and then, and then it switched again. Um, and right now, I think we've been in a, uh, we've been in a transition. Uh, cocaine was starting to go back up. Amphetamine use was starting to fall um, in the aughts. And I'm not exactly sure where we're at. We'd have to look at the household surveys. But um, it's been doing this going back all the way to, say, since we've been recording it into the like the 1700s or 1600s. It's interesting. Phenomenon. Um, your grandmother would remember that something was bad, but then the grandson doesn't remember and goes back to using it. So I lived in the 1980s. I was, that's when I was in, uh, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school, um, was in 1980s. And I was in actually high school in the mid, late 80s. I was actually in high school. And in the smoking lecture, I talked to you guys about, I put in perspective and I say before we outlawed, before they made the non-smoking laws, uh, what was it like in America where they smoked absolutely everywhere? And you know, what was that like? Well, cocaine in the eighties, they had forgot um, about all the dangers uh, in the 1920s and the, in the previous decades, they had forgot that it was dangerous and people were using it again. And I remember in the early 1980s, I was in uh, seventh grade and uh, my teacher had like uh, magazines, uh, paper magazines that, you know, they would subscribe to and you could, if you're done your assignment, you could like just read like magazine. It was like Teen Magazine, and People Magazine, and Time Magazine, whatever. And there was a Time Magazine and it was the cover of Time Magazine. And it was, a, it was the whole entire episode, the entire magazine was devoted um, to cocaine. And it was all, extolling the virtues of it, how it was the best miracle drug, how everybody that was important did it, how everybody in Hollywood was doing it, all the actors did it, and, and these moguls in industry were doing it, and it was the best drug, and uh, everybody should do it. That was like the early 80s. And then, of course, they figured out how to do the crack cocaine, and by the mid, mid of that 1980s, then we ended up with our epidemic, became inexpensive, and now everybody really could do it, and we weren't warned about it, and it really was more dangerous because with crack cocaine, now we were going to smoke it. And it got even more um, dangerous. But in my high school in the 1980s, people would wear. Now, I assume some of these people, what they were wearing was fake. But I would say, like, if you went to my high school, if you took a time machine back to my high school, people were wearing these little necklaces with the little, what became his uh, crack vials. <laughs> Back then, originally this was cocaine. And they were wearing these little co cocaine vials, like those ones I showed you with the heroin doses. And there would be a little bit of uh, white powder right inside the vial. And then they had like the little, the lid unscrewed and coming out of the lid was like a little tiny spoon, like a little plastic spoon or a metal spoon or something. And they could like dip it in their thing and be like, and snort it. Right? And they were insufflating it. And th in my high school, I kid you not, I don't know if they were, did they have baby powder in there? They were just wearing it to look cool or did they really have it? I, I don't know. Um, I have to say that friends of mine, they really did have it. They really were doing the drug. Uh, again, I didn't because I knew that I had the heart thing. And then I saw these athletes having heart attacks and dropping dead from their usage on the basketball courts. And I was like, and I was in a, U.S. ski team athlete at the time, so it was not for me, but I was still going to school in a public high school. There was 5,000 students in my public high school. It was really big, and um, it was crazy, right? And they all had them, and I saw teachers with them, too. I mean, so just put that in perspective, like how many people were using it and how bad it was. 
Um, and then everybody realized how bad it was. And then all these babies ended up being, um, we ended up having the crack babies. Because once uh, women start doing drugs in big numbers, eventually pregnant women are going to be doing it. And uh, you're going to be addicted. And if you're using your, while well, you're pregnant, then your baby's going to be addicted because there's like, no, it's going to cross the, it crosses the blood brain barrier. It definitely crosses the placental barrier. So whatever you're doing, your baby's doing. Right. And so we started having crack babies and then people realized, oh, this is bad. And then they changed the laws. And this is sort of interesting. So they started, have, they made uh, cocaine, they made sure that cocaine was illegal. But then everybody, all the non-rich people, they were using crack cocaine because it was cheaper. And you could get a great high from it. I mean, you just have a little tiny bit, you smoke it, you were high for hours and hours. Right, so they had their crack cocaine and so poor people were getting arrested with crack cocaine. Rich people were getting arrested with regular cocaine. They could still smoke it. They could freebase it. So some of us were learning a little bit about the inequities of our laws. Sometimes it's not um, race-based as much as it's class-based. And this was an economic. And so what they basically, and it affected white poor communities as much as black poor communities and Hispanic poor communities. Is what they basically said was, they changed the law and it was the same cocaine molecule, but they said, if you get caught with uh, crack cocaine, everything was double initially. Double the fines, double the incarceration time, like everything would be double. And um, then eventually they quadrupled it. <laughs> and so eventually what would happen is, and they made it like smaller and smaller amounts. So you could get caught with like a big bag of cocaine and maybe you'd pay a $300 fine. But if you got caught with like one tiny little rock of cocaine, you'd be in jail for five years. $50,000 fine. Good luck paying that off. You'll be back to jail if you ever get probation, probated. If you ever get probation. Um, a lot of the mass incarceration that we see today are people that got incarcerated under the 80s and 90s. They got, they got, these laws have not changed. So today, if you still get picked up for crack cocaine, but once they got put in laws, we, once we had like the third strike laws, like in California and whatnot, once you got picked up a couple times, once the third strike, now you were in prison for life and it led to life imprisonment. So a lot of the mass incarceration was actually um, not actually from marijuana, but marijuana did lead to mass incarceration because you get busted for marijuana, that would be your third strike. Right. But um, it really was crack cocaine that led to a lot of the mass incarceration and then marijuana just upped it. So once you, once you have one felony, you get another felony and, and you just, now you're in the, you're in the system. Um, most of these disparities have not been addressed in the system. You can still go to jail for longer for crack cocaine. And also there were, they, they put in rules, they made rules, they put in sentencing rules where they didn't want the judge to be able to like, let's say, you know, Elon Musk maybe got busted for crack cocaine and be like, oh, he's a good guy. Maybe they give him a lighter sentence. They said, no, they made it so that if you got busted for a crack cocaine, the judge couldn't use any, wasn't like, oh, it's his first time, he's never been arrested before. Judge couldn't do anything. All they could do is amount, how much did you have? Did you have any other drugs? And they went down the flow chart and it established like your fine and how many years in prison you had. And the judge couldn't use any um, judgment. They just had to follow a flow chart. And what they did was the automatic sentencing rules only applied at that time to crack cocaine. Um, they didn't apply to regular cocaine. So if you were wealthy and you were before the judge and you had a big bushel of cocaine, it'd be like, you bad boy or girl, you know, don't do that again, you know, pay the fine, right? But if you were poor and you had crack cocaine, you had automatic sentencing and you, and if you had marijuana on you too, oh boy, 10 year sentence, you were a dealer. Even if it wasn't dealer amounts. And some of you will have family members, you'll know people that got caught up in this, um, Excuse me. Or on drugs. Yes. Professor, also crack was a felony. Oh, yeah. It was absolute. It, all both were felony, but crack, it, it, maybe at some point the cocaine may have been a misdemeanor, but that was a felony yes. as well once they made it illegal. But it was still tiny amounts of crack was like 10 years in prison. Big right. amounts of cocaine was, a, was a, you know, yes. 30 days in jail. <laughs> 
I know it's <laughs> it's disgusting. Federal prison versus a local jail too. Like it was completely uh, uh, wrong, right? And, and it, when we talk about some of the systematic changes that we want to make, people aren't talking about throwing out the entire everything in our system. But some of these uh, some of these things are things that are easily addressed, and um, lawyers would like to address them. Police officers would like to address them. Mm -hmm. Political activists would like to see them addressed. When you hear about people saying we want to dismantle the system, they're not usually saying. There are some people that probably literally mean like they just want like <laughs> no laws or rules and just completely take it down. But I don't think that's what most people are. They're actually educated people mean like these really specific things. Like we still have to have laws. But why the disparity? Why if you're more like why the disparity where if you're poor you're being punished more than if you're rich for the same drug, right? Yeah, it's economic, I think. That's economic, um, but that's economic class system. Yes. And if we don't address all the equity issues, then economic becomes a race issue too. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, we're making good strides with some of this stuff. Yeah, let me go. I wanna make sure I get, if there's anything else in my slides. Oh. Oh, I know, I need to go to the uh, opiates. I'm going to take a break, though. So let's see if I had anything else I wanted to say about this. Um, oh, yeah, alcohol. That was why I brought this up. Oh, wait, well, Professor, before you go to alcohol, mm -hmm. when did uh, D.A.R.E. from Nancy Reagan? Like that was the 80s. That, that's my, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the D.A.R.E. generation. So I'm the generation that was basically told, we got zero sex ed education. That was when they were, we need to get rid of sex ed. It makes kids have sex, which is totally ridiculous, in my opinion. <laughs> kids will have sex or do stuff, they'll just be stupid about it. And then um, sex education was sort of gotten rid of, and then drug education became just say no. And that was also became the sex education. So they wrapped them together and we were the just say no edu uh, generation. They said, just say no. Just don't have sex and just don't do drugs. And that's all you need say to know. Now. That's just all you need to know. What else do you need to know? So, so no. what happens if I did the drug? Don't do it. Well, what happens if I got pregnant? You shouldn't have. <laughs> then you had no knowledge about how to protect yourself. What if I'm raped? Like they had no nothing. It was just like, just say no. Ooh. There's no nuance to that education. It was terrible, right? Which is a large reason why when I finally got the knowledge base that I have, I really wanted to teach this class. I don't want to teach sex ed. The psych department has great classes on human sexuality and all that, uh, sure. but I can definitely address some of the, this stuff. So you guys already learned, or you learn when you watch the video, that when alcohol goes into your liver, it's going to mix with the uh, alcohol dehydrogenase gene enzyme, rather, and then it's going to be metabolized into this other molecule called acetyl aldehyde and i talked about that in as well in the last class a little bit and acetaldehyde is a little less toxic than alcohol and again is responsible for some of the hangover effects and whatnot now when you break down cocaine if you take cocaine by itself and actually i should remember but i can't i have to look it up i'll look it up over the break if you take cocaine and it goes into the liver, you get a cocaine metabolite. And the cocaine is an active molecule. It can bind to the receptors. It can make you high. It can cross the blood brain barrier. The cocaine metabolite is actually not active. So it's not able, even if it crosses the blood brain barrier, it's not able to attach. It's been broken down too much that that business end can't uh, work. And I forget the name of it. The metabolites, I have, I have to look those up. But here's what I wanted to say is, when you take them together, last class we sort of ended on polypharmia, polypharmacy. I just wanted to show what happens if you take cocaine and alcohol at the same time. And they go into the liver and they're both going into the liver at the same time. They're gonna interact with the enzymes in a different way. And the liver is going to produce a new molecule called coca ethylene. And the ethyl, those of you watching 
Ethyl, that's the ethyl alcohol. That's, that's the type of alcohol we drink. And it turns out that coca ethylene, uh, not only does it keep you a little bit drunk, but this coca part is actually still active. So, I gotta ask this question, this would be like a good place to sort of pause. I take the cocaine alone and the metabolite breaks down and you know, whatever its half-life is, it's passing through, it's passing through and quickly it's eliminated and as it's passing through, it's becoming less and less and less active in my brain, right? I take the alcohol with the cocaine, it goes into my liver, I have the cocaine, it's got its own half-life, it's gonna stay in my body for a particular amount of time. But now I take it with the alcohol and when it mixes in my liver, it gets all mixed up in there and it pops out on the other side as a metabolite, it's still active. It still has the same activity, in fact, as the original cocaine molecule. So I, it, what is that going to do to the half-life of this molecule in terms of its psychoactive ability to continue to increase my heart rate, continue to make me feel high? It just increases it? Does it double it or? Yeah, it increases it. So now the coca ethylene has to circulate back through before finally it gets, the coca ethylene goes in and that finally gets metabolized and it's finally made inactive. So it basically gives it an extra pass. The two together make the cocaine have an extra pass through the liver before it's broken down. So it extends its half-life. And I've known cocaine users, obviously, just for just telling you, like all these people in my high school. Um, and that was one of the first things they discover was they would use the cocaine by itself and then they'd be, you know, they'd get high for an hour or whatever, a couple would come down in an hour or two and then it would be over. But if they had cocaine with the alcohol, they'd get through the cocaine, then they'd drink the beer and suddenly their cocaine, they could be high for like five hours. And they thought that was great. But also, what is that doing to the LD50? When you take them. It's increasing it? Yeah. When you take them together, because that high half-life is continuing, it, you're increasing the risk of having the drug-drug interaction. You're also, if a few hours later, someone gives you another bump to do, another line to do, another to take, right? You already have say coca ethylene active and now you're going to take cocaine on top of that that's going to keep bumping up your dose levels right and it could get to a dose that becomes the ld50 dose right so we see a lot more accidental overdoses again when you're combining drugs exactly why you the, the celebrities you hear oh they had more than one drug in their system alcohol and cocaine um very very commonly um taken together and very common uh, overdose um, when you look at overdosing from cocaine, and I guess let me do that and we'll finish, I'll take a break. The first sign that someone's overdosing, they might feel a little nausea, a little queasy, you know, they maybe they want to throw up. Before that, they might feel like a little really rapid heart rate, right? They might feel a little faint. You know, like they just ugh, weak, right? Uh, I feel nauseous and my heart's beating and I don't feel that good. That's like stage one overdose. Stage two overdose, they actually start to vomit and they'll have diarrhea. And that's because the nervous system in the fight or flight is shutting down the, the nervous system. It wants to get rid of anything that's in the system, uh, evacuate it, make you lighter, you're gonna need to run or fight. So you're, you're gonna throw up anything in your stomach and you're gonna dump right anything that's in your intestines and then, and then everything just slows to a stop. Like the blood supply stops, right? And then the next stage of overdose, and these can progress quite quickly. They have a, they have a seizure, right? As the brain is, sending a signal so fast, right? It causes their muscles to start uh, over being overstimulated. 
It causes their heart rate um, to go up, so that usually leads to a heart attack. So you can just die from a heart attack. If you don't die from the heart attack, um, eventually when the heart rate gets so fast, right, then you stop uh, no circulation. And the same thing's actually happening with your breath. Your lungs only fill when you're inhaling. Then you exhale, then you inhale. If you just start inhaling, then you never exhale and all the tra all the dead air actually stays in your body and you're not actually exchanging air either. So um, that's how you overdose from a stimulant like cocaine. And I have to tell you, I didn't know it until I went to medical school, but going to parties in the 1980s, high school parties, I had several friends that absolutely had gone all the way through the stage two and they were, they were going into stage three of overdose. And I never knew it until I went to med school. And they started describing the stages of the overdose. And I, I did not know that my friend was at risk of dying. Like you see in Breaking Bad, like when uh, Jesse's girl, um, am I gonna do a spoiler alert? People die. There's an overdose on heroin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was like, did I not know? I didn't know those were signs. And a pretty good friend of mine, vomiting, diarrhea. Interestingly enough, that person, that night I saw them vomiting and having diarrhea. That was actually the first time they ever did a cocaine. It wasn't crack cocaine, it was just regular cocaine. Um, and they had the whole thing. They went out in the yard. I remember they were throwing up and, and shitting their pants. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, what a terrible drug. <laughs> and I doubt names have been changed to protect the innocent. I doubt Chris, I doubt he'll ever do that again. You know, who would ever do a drug that makes you throw up and have diarrhea? Well, at the same time he was throwing up and having diarrhea, he was also having euphoria. When you have euphoria, everything's great. Do you know that of all my friends, he's one of the ones that went on to have a lifelong addiction. He was admitted to Stanford on a full scholarship to study astrophysics and ended up flunking out after the first year. Naked, stripped naked in the, one of the Stanford uh, fountains, the big fountains they have on campus. Yeah. And he was puking and shitting his pants the first night he did it. And he still ended up an addict. Ended up uh, loading trucks. Nothing wrong with that. But you have the mind to be an astrophysicist full, full, full four year scholarship to Stanford. Loading trucks. <laughs> now, let me just do a stop share. Let's do a 15 minute break. And I do want to be able to talk a little bit about uh, opiates when we get back. And I'm sure I haven't talked about everything I wanted to say about stimulants and all that. But um, I want to be able to talk a little bit about the opiates and a little bit about the hallucinogens before, before I let you guys go. And um, so let's do, a, I guess it's like a mic clock there, like a 12 minute break, I guess. Come back at like around 11.02, something like that. Uh, I don't know, 11.05, there will be a 15 minute break. I'll be able to drink some water and walk around. I gotta stop, pause, it's recording. All right, let me go back to my screen share. Oh, actually, not that one. I wanted to remind you guys, so let me do the other screen. I wanted to share my... Hey, is this screen? Oh, it's this screen. Okay. Share. Yeah. So when you're in modules, I have lecture outlines for everything that go with these lectures and go with the orange book. So again, in let's go down to this fourth unit. So alcohol. So there's a lecture outline that goes with it. Someone I forget who asked me, maybe Tony or somebody at the beginning of the class. Like so, I've got the lecture outline. It sort of highlights key important things. And I've got a lecture outline for alcohol. Lecture outline. For 
nicotine, lecture outline for marijuana, even though I combine them together into a combined talk, so I still provided you the marijuana outline and the nicotine outline. And I checked at the break to see, because it's been a long time, I they didn't have the, the outline out. It's here, this is the outline for stimulants. Um, it talks about cocaine, amphetamine, a little bit of history of cocaine, the overdose, like I just talked about. Um, effects in pregnancy, let's just say, there's no safe amount, there's no safe time to use cocaine and amphetamine and whatnot during pregnancy. It does cause problems with the babies. They can be born with low birth weights, which makes them less likely to survive the first year of life. Um, they can be born premature or low, low birth weights, which makes them more likely to have cerebral palsy, more likely to have learning disabilities, right? Um, so, talked about cocaethylene, talked about crack, amphetamine, methamphetamine, treatments. There are really no specific treatments specific to cocaine or methamphetamine abuse. When we look at all the addictions, we don't have good treatment options for any particular type of addiction. We have a one size fits all, 12 uh, step programs, detox programs, talk therapy, high relapse rates, something like 50 to 70% of all people that go into treatment for cocaine and methamphetamine will relapse. About one in five people that use it will become addicted to it. The, the last one that I wanted to sort of talk about is something a little bit more common, which are the xanthines. And lots of us use the xanthines because we use caffeine, for example, and maybe when you drink your tea, you don't realize that some of the calming effects and some of the effects that you're feeling and the theophylline, and the, when you take a, you have a cold and you take a tea to sort of help with your uh, chest, maybe help breathe more freely, right? That's often the theophylline and the threobromine that are actually found in the tea itself. And those are the xanthines. And I wanted to say a little bit about the xanthines before we move on to the opiates and the uh, hallucinogens. So let me share my iPad. the wrong stuff. So I started writing a little bit here. So this is where we left off. We were talking about this. You go through the stimulants and you're overdosing, right? That a lot of people that uh, use stimulants, they often, if they're young, when they use stimulants, they can have a silent heart attacks. And their heart has got so much enough muscle and so much extra cells in it at a young age that even though they've had a heart attack, which means they've lost thousands, if not millions of heart cells in the heart attack, they lose like 100,000 cells a second during a heart attack. I don't know. That beast within video says how many heart cells you lose a second. It's crazy. But you lose a lot of heart cells per second. And, um, but if you're young, you might have enough backup heart cells that you don't notice, you don't experience it. Right? So sometimes they call that silent, but you still have the heart injury so when you get older and your heart cells begin to die off naturally, but now you have the big defect in there from when you were young, they can have underlying heart disease from having been used uh, stimulants when they were younger. Um, the xanthines, these are very mild stimulants. And most people would never rob their families or uh, quit their jobs over whether or not they could uh, get caffeine, for example. Um, but we still use them in our society. They're, for a lot of us, they might be the only uh, addicting drug that we might use. And uh, they definitely are addicting, uh, but they're mostly, uh, the withdrawal from the addiction isn't that significant. A little grumpy, maybe a little headache, a little agitated, maybe a little tired. And it wears off in about a day or so and, and you're, you're, you're withdrawn. And, um, I was on stomach ache, right? Some people can get stomach aches from it. Some people get stomach aches when they withdraw from it. Some people get stomach aches when they take it. That's a weird one for caffeine. I've known people that they, they go to the, come to the doctor's office when I still practice and they were complaining about chronic stomach pain, stomach pain, stomach pain. And it turned out that they were eating too much caffeine. Got them off the caffeine and all their stomach pains miraculously went away. But remember, it's a stimulant. So it's shutting down those intestines. Some people feel pain when, when their intestines shut down. Some people feel pain when their intestines speed up. 
right? It's your own personal perspective. Now, the xanthines, they're different. Up until now, all the drugs we've looked at, they all mimic or act like a neurotransmitter. The xanthines are different. Um, they're what we call neuromodulators. They're a neuromodulator molecule. What a neuromodulator is, is it's a molecule that changes the behavior of a neurotransmitter. So the neurotransmitter is in your body, it's working, then you take the neuromodulator, the neuromodulator attaches itself or interferes in some way or changes the way that neurotransmitter can bind or attach. It might make it work more strongly. It might make it work less strongly. In the case of the xanthines, it absolutely has a, uh, right? It definitely changes the effect of the neurotransmitter and the neurotransmitter that it's going to change the effect of is a neurotransmitter called adenosine. And caffeine and theophylline and 3-L-bromine, these are all xanthines, they all can come and they can interact and they can attach to adenosine. They don't interact with the receptor that adenosine interacts with. They interact with adenosine and they change adenosine's ability to work. They modulate the neurotransmitter. They're a neuromodulator. And uh, just a little thing, uh, caffeines are found in a lot of molecules, a lot of plants, including the coffees, the teas, and the chocolates. Theophylines and the 3 bromines tend to be found more in tea leaves, different types of teas. But just go to a grocery store and look at the herbal section. There's like so many different types of tea leaves. Uh, and I want to just focus in on this adenosine molecule. So adenosine, this is the neurotransmitter that normally is functioning in your brain. And since I didn't do chapter 15 with you, I wanted to just talk a little bit about adenosine right here. So adenosine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. A very poor performing question on the exam actually was being able to know the three characteristics of an inhibitory neurotransmitter and the three characteristics of an excitatory neurotransmitter. Inhibitory neurotransmitters, they make action potentials less likely. They do that by hyperpolarizing the membrane, which means another way of saying that is it takes it away from threshold. Excitatory neurotransmitters do the opposite. They make action potentials more likely because they depolarize the membrane because they make it go towards threshold. And there was a question on the test where I had all six and you had to click the three. If you, if you were depending on the stem, you're either given um, excitatory and you had to click knowing the three things or you were given an inhibitory and know to click the three things. And you guys struggled with that question. Um, it's a concept. It's not really going to, I'm not going to test that exact question again, but the concept is here. Inhibitory molecules make action potentials less likely. That means they're going to make neural action potentials not fire, right? So they're going to have a calming effect on the brain. Uh, one, one, of the, one of you guys did your project uh, looking at uh, the different um, pain medications, and you saw that the gabapentin, gabapentin was one that could block pain by, by depressing right, the brain so you don't feel the pain signals. And um, this is what adenosine does. It acts in the same way like GABA, right? It has this calming effect on the brain. So now in comes caffeine or any xanthine. And it's going to block. What it does is you got the xanthine molecule, you got the adenosine molecule. When the xanthine attaches to it, it gives it the wrong shape. So now it has trouble interacting with its receptor. Like it can't bind to its receptor, so it doesn't work. So it, xanthine uh, blocks adenosine from working. And students sometimes have trouble with then what it does. Because you guys know, if I take caffeine, some of you have had coffee or something, does it make my heart rate go up, down, or stay the same? It 
go up. Make it go up. Makes it go up, right? Because again, it's part of that. It's a stimulant, so it's going to cause that part of your brainstem to be sending out like a lot of signals, and it's getting you ready for fight or flight, right? It's going to get your heart beating really fast. So that's what caffeine does. But here's the thing: it doesn't do it directly. So it blocks adenosine from working. And again, adenosine is inhibitory. So what zeanthine does, what caffeines do, is they block the inhibitory molecule from working. When you block an inhibitory molecule from working, that's not exactly the same as directly excitatorily stimulating something. It's not gonna have as big a punch as say cocaine or amphetamine, because those molecules come and they bind to the same receptors that say epinephrine binds to, but they bind stronger and they cause more action potentials. Adenosine would normally bind and cause a depression of the brain and less action potentials. Xanthines come attached to the adenosine molecule and prevent it from working. So I'm preventing the inhibitory from depressing the brain. What effect will that have on the brain? I inhibit the inhibitory molecule. I stop the inhibitory molecule from working. So it'll have the opposite effect. It'll have an, a mild excitatory effect. And it's a little bit like a double negatives when someone says, I'm not not doing it. I'm not not doing something. What does that mean? It means I'm doing it. I'm not not doing it. That's what's going on with this. I'm inhibiting a negative thing. I'm making it, I'm stopping a negative thing from working, which means it's going to have an opposite effect. It's going to be excitatory. Okay, here's the analogy I give. In a car, here's my steering wheel. Down on the floor, you've got two pedals. You've got the accelerator pedal and you've got a brake pedal. And you guys know, if you push on the accelerator pedal, you speed up. That would be like the typical stimulants they are like the gas pedal. You, you take cocaine, you speed up. You take amphetamine, you speed up. It's like stepping on the accelerator pedal for your brain. Adenosine is normally the brake. Normally, your brain speeds up, uses excitatory neurotransmitters, and it uses the inhibitory neurotransmitters like GABA and adenosine to slow down. You, you apply the brake. You apply adenosine, it inhibits the brain. You got an accelerator, you got a brake. Here comes caffeine. Caffeine comes in and it wedges itself like underneath the brake. It wedges itself in there. Picture somebody takes a rock and they put it behind your brake before you got in the car, you didn't know it. It's like underneath the brake. And you get in your car, and you rest your foot on the brake, it feels okay, you start the car, everything seems okay. You put the car in drive, right? And you start accelerating, you're moving, right? And then you take your foot off the gas, you might stay at the same speed, right? But if you wanna slow down, you put your foot on the brake. But the brake is blocked. There's a rock behind it, it doesn't work right anymore. So you go to push your foot on the brake. Do you slow down? No, you can't slow down. You can't slow down. Which means unless there's a big hill, the only thing you can do is speed up and coast and speed up and coast and speed up and coast. So when you're taking caffeine, you're taking away that brake, right? And so every time your brain uses the excitatory neurotransmitter, it's speeding up and then you gotta coast at that higher speed, but it actually can't slow down because it doesn't have the brake, right? That's what xanthines do. They stop the brake from working. So it has this, you can't slow the brain down as easily. So it has this mild excitatory effect. Right? Is this the same for like when you um, take a lot of sugars in and things like that? 
and get that like sugar rush kind of? Yeah, I guess maybe a sugar rush. Uh, has a lot of other effects going on, but it also sugar does have psychoactive effects where you do get dopamine. You get high actually from the sugar. Um, I actually commented on someone's project. Did you guys know if they take a person and they put them in a functional MRI machine and they have them take a smoke crack cocaine in the MRI machine and have it light up, they can see how the brain pattern looks when you're smoking crack cocaine in the hospital, right? Then they have them with heroin. They inject them. This is in a lab. They inject them with heroin and they, they image their brain and they actually, they use addicts that are already using the drug anyways. And it, and it lights up. Then they take people that aren't addicts at all and don't have obesity and don't have weight addictions. Like they're not addicts to food and they give them a single Oreo cookie to eat. Their brain lights up with the same pattern as a heroin addict. What? Have you ever, when I used to come, I don't actually eat Oreo cookies because I actually had trouble uh, regulating them when I was a kid. I would come home from school and if there was Oreo cookies in the house, I would eat the whole package. And I always thought it was weird because I was like, I liked them, but at the same time, it was a bit disgusting. If you reached the point where you were kind of full and it was like, but it would still be like, oh, one more, oh, one more. And, I, and I, I was always a little bit confused by it. It wasn't until med school that I found out that they're like incredibly addicting. No, <laughs> Some of you will probably have had that experience with Oreo cookies. It's the sugar and fat combination. So I don't know if it's really the same thing as sugar. Sugar has its own unique pattern on the brain. But um, sugar definitely speeds your brain up and makes you high. Yeah, I, you know what? Um, I never really understood that, but I see it with my daughters. Because that's why we get... Uh, it really affects sugar. children's brains. Yeah. But, uh, children's brains that are sensitive to it. It wouldn't affect, like, all children's brains. No, I know, but I'm just saying, like, they have a harder time going to bed. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Any parent that's ever given their kid a bunch of... Tell me your kid doesn't act the same way around Easter and thank, and uh, Halloween. They, they don't. <laughs> They don't have to say. Glad to know I'm not only an Oreo addict. <laughs> yeah, there's other Oreo addicts out there. I don't know if we have to go to like self-help groups or anything, but um, they have the I don't know if it's like ruin anybody's life, but they're like super hard to stop eating once you eat one. I don't bring them into my house. Oh, so we like should. I literally will eat them till I'm sick. So it's like kryptonite. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. What is like your favorite Oreo flavor? Because there's many flavors at the end, or do you like the original ones? Oh. It's the original. I haven't, you know, here's my thing. I don't need any more addictions. I already got, I already got addicted to the first variety. I'm not really, I'm not going to extend that out. <laughs> it's like more and more. It's like my gateway drug. <laughs> so, it is. Luckily, I'm actually allergic to food coloring and a bunch of stuff. So when the newer versions came out, it made it really a lot easier for me to avoid them. I can't actually eat Oreo cookie brand. They have a couple, something uh, vanilla that I'm allergic to. So I can only eat um, like the Newman's brand. But the Newman's brand puts like hydrogenated oil. No, no, they put, uh, what do you call it? Palm oil. And I won't eat the palm oil because I, I, I care about the orangutans. I think that they just make me so sad. So don't worry, we'll work on getting you one that you're not allergic to. I have to make it from scratch. I have made them from scratch. Oh, gosh. I have made homo handmade Oreos. Okay, so where we're at now is we're now headed into our final little bit. And I really wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, hallucinogens and opiates. And so let me get to my PowerPoint. And let me do a share screen somewhere. Oh. All right. Now I'm totally confused with my end show. All right. I have to find you guys. I lost my, uh, there it is. Okay, share screen. Okay, and then I can. So. Oh, I didn't change that. I know this isn't my, my, my PowerPoint because I know I've changed all those to uh, contrasting colors, not black on blue. If you have yellow, blue, 
um, color impairedness. You're not going to be able to see very well the opium, the wording that I have on the screen. So I apologize for that. But it says uh, right here, it says opium, and it says derived from the opium poppy. And this is actually a picture of the opium poppy. This is the flower. They're beautiful. They're kind of about oh, four to eight inch diameter flower. It's related to the California poppy. And um, they mostly grow well and produce a lot of their chemical when they have to be grown at high altitude um, in a very dry climate. You can grow these uh, poppies in California, but they won't produce that much opiates. But it's also illegal to um, harvest any opium from them. And the DEA could raid your yard and arrest you if they found uh, opium poppies growing in your yard. But they will sometimes come up. Birds will drop the seeds because they're all over the birds migrate and you will sometimes randomly have have them show up in your uh, in your yard. And the flower, here's like a third thing. So like tobacco, it was the leaf. Marijuana was the flower. Cocaine, it was the leaf. Here's a third part. The opiate is actually going to come from the ovary of the flower, not the, and, and so the, here's the flower. Here's the male parts around the outside. Let me pick up that. Uh, Where's my little highlighter? Pointer options. Laser pointer. So this is the female part. It sticks up higher. And then this is the male part of the flower. And again, it gets pollinated by wind and bees just the same way that the other flowers do their thing. And what happened is it'll come and a bee will land down here and it'll pollinate it. And then once it gets pollinated, the flower dies back, whether it's pollinated or not, the flower dies back the petals all fall off and then you're left with this part that you like this part here is this part right here dries up and it's left with this hard thing and this is actually inside of here would be all the the ovaries if they got fertilized now there'd be little seeds in there which are baby plants right you could harvest those seeds and then plant and make more flowers in this case more poppies so if you take this um well and harvest and you you harvest the sap that comes out of this ovary in that sap is the opiate. So before I get there, let me uh, talk a little bit about the opiates. So these are classified as narcotics. Um, that was a classification that the government came up with. And uh, they're on the Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 um, mostly, uh, which Schedule 1 being illegal, Schedule 2, 3, we might mix them into other drugs, uh, like we might make a medicine, you have diarrhea, the side effect of opiates is they constipate you. So if someone's having diarrhea, we might give you an opiate as a side effect, right? To, to, to get rid of, in that case, it's not the side effect, it's the therapeutic effect. We want to uh, get rid of your diarrhea, but oops, you got high, there's the side effect. Um, and anyways, they're classified as a narcotic. Uh, the class one may only be like in a hospital or not at all. Like maybe you're, we just cracked your chest open during surgery and we would drop the anesthetic, the opiate directly into your IV to help you recover from the immediate surgery or during the surgery. Um, it actually binds to these endogenous molecules uh, that are in our own bodies. We have these molecules in our bodies called endorphins and enkephalins, and they have a shape, just like the way cannabinoids have their shape and the way uh, amphetamines have their shape that look like epinephrine. So these have their shape. Endorphins and enkephalins have their shape. And it turns out the opiates, and here's the opiate derived drugs. Um, let me advance. Here are the opiate drugs heroin, morphine, codeine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, um, methadone. Trying to, trying to think. Some other names of drugs you've probably heard of, right? These are all the um, man-made. But if we look at the original opiate, it more or less, uh, well, heroin pretty much is the molecule that the plant is making. This is the molecule that the plant is making. It's pretty complicated. But the business end, you can still see, if I pick up a highlighter, yeah, OK, I got a good color. I pick up the highlighter, right? We still see like this. Oh, that highlighter is a terrible color. All 
All right, apparently nothing's going to show up on the screen. But you can see they all have the same shape in here. It doesn't matter whether it's the plant-derived molecule or whether it's all these man-made molecules. They all have the same or more or less shape, slightly different versions of each other. Some versions will cross the blood-brain barrier quickly. Some will have a worse LD50. Some of them have a better LD50 and so on. Um, and that's why scientists have made the different molecules, again, like fentanyl and carfentanyl, like I mentioned in the last week. Um, and here's like a close-up. Uh, these molecules are sort of hard to see. Here's a close-up of the Oxycontin. This one is people, has a very long half-life, so it's, it's good. I have really bad pain. These heroin molecules I go in, and a few hours later it's down, you've got to take it again, take it again, take it again. It's actually not that good as a pain reliever. I would rather prefer a pain reliever that I take like once a day or twice a day, and I'm, I'm, I'm without pain for a long time. And so doctors, we asked the chemist to develop an opiate that would have a long-lasting effect, and I could... My patient could take it for a long time and they came up with this one. This is the Oxycontin. And Oxycontin in the late 90s, unfortunately, it was a great drug. And then um, drug addicts discovered they could take the pill, oral, it was made orally, and instead of ingesting it orally with a slow absorption rate, first pass effect, lower addiction rates, they figured out, they were addicts already, they figured out they could take the pill and chop it up and then snort it and insufflate it and get a higher dose to the brain and, and so on. And anyways, it ended up fueling the beginning of our opiate epidemic was actually fueled with people taking Oxycontins the wrong way, abusing them. Uh, and then eventually, uh, what I showed you last class, LD50 on these, uh, the reason they're on the schedule and the reason the LD50 and whatnot are so poor for these drugs is because of this. Stop share. Share screen. iPad. Share. Right here is heroin. Right, that's the LD50, the amount of drug there, that, then that's like what's more or less coming out of the poppy plant, right? Then this is the man-made fentanyl and then the carfentanyl as we're moving up, right? We're seeing that we're less and less and less drug is having a bigger effect. That's again, because they were invented for veterinarians to treat elephants, but then human beings end up taking these drugs or we make counterfeit medications from these drugs and it causes uh, a lot of problems. Um, I wanted to actually, Apparently in my uh, slide here, I want to show you the opiate harvest because I'm going to get to my chrome, do this. So if someone has to take morphine, I, if you do, I do surgery on you and I inject you with morphine in the hospital, where does the opiate for that morphine come from? Like the flower that you're talking about, like the poppy flower? Or? It came from the flower, but where is that flower grown? So like I'm a hospital in the United States and I purchased morphine and that morphine was made in it by a pharmaceutical company here in the United States. Let's say Bayer, or whatever, <laughs> some pharmaceutical company, Biogen, whatever. They made Biogen. the drug. Where was the opium that they got to make the morphine from? Where was that opium actually grown? Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. We import it. Mm -hmm. We import pure opium, illegal opium, into the United States. We pay Afghanis to grow it. We import it into the United States to be used in the medical field, to be put into our Vicodins, to be put into our morphine. So we, we already have, a, when, you wonder, when you worry about the trade, like the drug wars, is one of the reasons why it'll be impossible is we already have a legal route to import illegal drug. So there's already a legal route for importing this illegal drug because it's totally legal to use it in this setting by the FDA. So if there's already a legal route of importation, that just means somebody can be bribed, somebody can siphon some off, right? You're, you're, you're never, we think, oh, all the drugs, we can stop all the cocaine coming from uh, South America or something. No, there's always going to be, by the way, is there a drug that I use in the hospital? Do I use, can I administer cocaine in a hospital? 
Yes, as long as you don't um, OD uh, the person, right? As long as I don't kill my patient. Or, yeah. yeah, it's actually used uh, only in use in an operating room, and it's only used in really limited uh, circumstances, and it's actually only found in a nasal spray. It's only used for actual nasal surgery, sinus surgery, because one of its side effects is it constricts blood vessels. And if I want to do surgery on the nose and head, I can inject, uh, I have them take cocaine. Now, they're under anesthesia. They're hooked up. They have an anesthesiologist right there breathing for them and everything. So if it crosses their blood brain barrier and their heart were to speed up, right, the anesthesiologist is right there. They can give them a drug to slow their heart rate, right? Not, they won't die. But I would actually have cocaine. So that means that we actually have uh, canisters of cocaine uh, that can be administered like a nasal spray. So that means we also import cocaine into the United States to be in made in. So don't make it that people think that you could stop all the drug wars just by stopping everything at the border. Because we have a legal way of having it come in. And if there's a legal way, the legal way can always be circumvented. So um, with that being said, like, uh, for getting the opium from Afghanistan, is there a way of them just being able to grow it here in the United States? Yes, but it won't be as the same quality. They would need a lot more of it. And to get to the levels that you would need to make, to manufacture the, the trillions of doses that we need in the United States to take care of stuff, you wouldn't really be able to grow it. We don't have the altitude or the climate for it, but mm -hmm. you can grow it like, you know, maybe a, um, somebody living on a, commune that doesn't want to have that's totally dropped out of life and they don't they're never going to go to a grocery store again and they, they might be able to make their own uh, small amount just for the commune <laughs> you know like the pain reliever from a few poppies that they might be able to grow um and as i wanted to show you let me uh did i share screen yet i don't know where i'm at oh yeah i'm sharing my This is what I wanted to share. So these are actually images in Afghanistan. These are like, this is an Afghan. These would be their fields. They're very, very, very high up in the, in the high valleys, in the high mountains, in the high altitude mountains. I think they grow around, around beginning around 11,000 feet, 12,000 feet, they're very high up. We have high altitudes in the United States, but they're not so arid. And anyways, what will happen is once the flowers die back, and I didn't, I Googled, I didn't want to Google like the fields of the flowers, what I wanted to hear is like, you can see the flowers. Once the flowers die back, then you're left with these ovaries. But you see what they've done is they've come with a knife and they've scored along the ovary. I don't know if I can make it big enough. Right, they've scored with a knife on the ovary and then the sap begins to ooze out, right? And in that sap is opiate. And so then if they take and they collect all that sap and bring that all together, that's pure opium. And then from that, we can ex create, extract the morphines and then all the other things. Um, that can be injected, that can be smoked. If you were to uh, have a, a poppy plant in your yard and it's scored like that, I think it's, uh, it's a felony. I think it's uh, 20 years, first offense, federal prison, something like that. Don't do it. People do it. I wouldn't do it. The risk is unbelievable. Looks like um, a stuffed jalapeno with cheese. That's its actual chemical name. Papaver somniferum. Somniferum. You guys know what that means? It's just a somnif. Is that in Latin? Is that in Spanish? Oh, when I can't fall asleep, what do you call it? What do you say I have? Insomnia. Insomnia, in meaning without somnia. When you see that somni, that means sleep. So Papa Ver somnia, it was like a sleep aid. You take it and you go to sleep. Yeah, you go to sleep and you take too much of it. You go to sleep and don't wake up. Again, spoiler alert on Breaking Bad, but somebody dies of a heroin overdose on Breaking Bad. They take too much and they go to sleep. They have respiratory depression. They stop breathing, right? Their heart stops. And that's what I wanted to just get to the end of these opiates. The way you die from opiates is completely different than the way you die from stimulants. Right, so we're talking about the stimulants, overdose, 
everything, your brain stem starts shooting out, shooting out so much, your heart rate's beating so fast, you're breathing too fast, and you're beating too fast to circulate air and to circulate blood, and you die. With opiates, it's a completely different thing. And let me share my iPad. I am like the matrix here with all this stuff I have. So when we look at the opiates, oops, I'm running with yellow. Maybe a darker color. When we look at the overdose, it has a different effect. Uh, opiates have a depressant effect. The endorphins and the enkephalins These are molecules that your body uses to modulate pain. So if you're in pain, your body naturally makes these endorphins and these enkephalins and they make you feel less pain. Um, if you, um, less physical pain, less psychological pain. And it depresses the brain and the brain stem. It has a depressant effect, right? Like that, kind of like a GABA-like effect. So, Essentially, if you take enough of these opiates, if your brainstem gets so, like alcohol, uh, actually an alcohol overdose and an opiate overdose look really similar. They just, they fall asleep. As the brainstem keeps you awake or not, they go to sleep. And then as their brainstem gets more and more sedated, they stop sending their heart signals. So they, the heart stops beating and they stop sending the respiratory signals. So their breathing stops and they just, they look like they go to sleep, but they just go to sleep and die and they stop breathing. And they stop uh, having a heart rate. And obviously, if you can't breathe, you don't have a heart rate. Like that's, yeah. Um, and so it's very, you still die from these. And um, actually, uh, Matthew had mentioned last class, in his generation, um, people were doing what they called the speed balls. And this is why they did the speed balls. The speed balls were dangerous because they're polypharmacy. And we now know that that makes the lethal doses a lot worse. But what they were doing was they were taking opiate like heroin and they were combining it into the same needle, it's like my syringe, they put opiate in there and then they also put in a stimulant, whether it's, um, it'll either usually be cocaine or a methamphetamine, one of the amphetamines, it doesn't really matter. And then they put them together in the same thing and you inject, so this one's making you really, really high. This one's making you really, really high with euphoria. Okay, and they're like the opiate is making you really tired, but the stimulant is making you really active. And I don't know, so somehow they were kind of like counteracting each other and maybe just staying high for a really, really long time. But the problem is a little bit too much of one or a little bit too much of the other, a little bit too much of the stimulant and your heart will speed up and you'll die, a little bit too much of the opiate and your heart will stop and you'll die, right? And mixing the two together, it's just, uh, I guess the expression would be like Russian roulette. Like, yeah, like when you put the bullet, one bullet in the, like in a five chamber gun, you spin the chamber and then you, you don't know who, you don't know. You might, you might do this a hundred times and never die, but on the hundred and first time, you get a little bit too much of one and the two together and the side effects and you, and you die. So you see a lot of these uh, overdoses and usually again, accidental overdoses. Um, they're not usually trying to commit suicide, it, suicide, they can commit suicide by overdosing, but a lot of the times we think of these things as accidental. They were only trying to get high. Now, when I was a medical student and a medical resident, the opiate epidemic was just really taking off um, in the 90s and into the aughts and on. Our war in Afghanistan, there was a lot of things that, that, that led to that politically, but nonetheless, we had people using opiates in the hospital. And I remember I was working at um, Cook County Hospital in Chicago. 
the uh, TV show that's off the air now, but it, it had George Clooney in it back in the 90s. It was, um, I don't actually remember the name of it. It was one of Elsewhere. Oh, it was actually, it wasn't the one that was Elsewhere. That was another famous one. It, it, uh, it just it spurred from my, from my house. <laughs> Thank you. It was called ER. It was actually the name of it, ER, but it was a show. It wasn't like a live ER show. It was like a scripted show. And, but it took place. The actual show, it was based on the fictional characters originally and everything, but the show was actually took place at Cook County Hospital. That was actually where it was based. But the show version of Cook County Hospital was much, much nicer than the Cook County Hospital that I rotated through. And Cook County Hospital, it's one of the, Cook County is right in the uh, inner city of Chicago, very, very poor neighborhoods, a lot of veterans, a lot of poor people and whatnot. And, um, the hospital was overstaffed and underfunded, and um, it was before we had things like, uh, like we're California, like where we have our insurance for everybody. So people didn't have insurance. They would go to the county hospital to try to get treatment. And my patients would be coming in, let's say they had had a trauma, a uh, car accident, and I was supposed to reconstruct their foot and ankle. And we'd have all these, back in the days of pagers, and we'd have all these pagers on us, a pager for every different thing. And right as visiting hours would end, my first day, or somewhere my first day, visiting hours ended, and um, my pagers started going off all at once. And um, some of the pagers, they would actually had a speaker, they would talk to you. And it turned out all over the hospital, my patients were OD. And because I was their patient, their doctor, I was being called to their bedside to treat the overdose as a crash. The nurses are there, but their patient, the doctors to come in. And, um, and I, it was my first day and we treated like 10 overdoses and um, it was crazy. And I turned to the resident as I was just a third or fourth year medical student. And I was like, what is going on? What is this? What's happening? And he goes, oh, these are, these are all uh, opiate overdoses. I go, why, why, why did it all happen? Like right at 5.30, I forget what the visiting hours ended, but why did it all happen right at 5.30? He goes, oh, well, what happens is when people are addicted. They get admitted for whatever they have whatever reason they got admitted to a hospital because they, they needed help, but they're still addicts and their drug dealers come to the hospital during visiting hours and during visit hours, they deal, they're dealing and there's a lot of people around. So they wait, the patients wait to do their drugs. But as soon as visiting hours are over and the, and the, the wards start to sort of empty out a little bit. And there was only like one nurse for like 30 patients. So she couldn't keep an eye out or he couldn't keep an eye out. And so what would happen is then they would, the drugs were under their bed. They take their drugs out and they would be shooting up in bed and they'd be dying. And um, I still remember running the code and the patient was dead. He had no heartbeat. He had no respiratory. Uh, the, they were about to call it, but we got there and we administered the, the drugs and everything to reverse the uh, overdose, right? You guys actually know this drug now. Like Narcan, it could be given nasally. Back then it could only be given as like a needle. Like an spray you can take. Um, and so we would give him Narcan, and Narcan bumps the opiate off the receptor so that it, it's no longer stimulating the neurons and it can stop the overdose. But if there's still drug in their body, it'll, it'll once the Narcan wears off, then more opiate will get on and they'll have another overdose. So you have to keep administering it, right, until the drug is all gone. Well, anyways, I gave him the Narcan, and they wake up instantly. So my patient was basically dead. I gave him the Narcan and he instantly woke up, looked at me, uh, woke up, actually tried to punch me and I backed off and I said, what are you doing? He goes, you just ruined the best high I've ever had. I said, sir, you were dead. No, you ruined the best high I ever had. Sir, you were dead for over three minutes without a heartbeat or breathing. And that's when I realized addictions are something special. That euphoria the hijacking of that reward system is unbelievable. <laughs> I'll leave that with opiates. Um, let me see what I've got. Something with it. Does medical cocaine come from the same place as street cocaine? It comes from the same place, right? It's grown in Afghanistan, but street cocaine is usually smuggled in through another process versus, uh, I mean, 
cocaine, what I did. Cocaine comes from South America, um, but the medical grade cocaine, it's being manufactured in a, in a, they're bringing the powder to concentrate over the border, but then it's being concentrated and purified more so in a, in a actual pharmacy company. And it's much stronger and more pure. The cocaine that you would get on the streets have been uh, usually adulterated. Uh, dealers will take some off and add a little bit of white, plain white powder, keep a little for themselves and they keep reducing it and cutting it and um, whatnot. So by the time you get it at the street level, it usually has a lot of other molecules in it, um, including uh, molecules that uh, lidocaine to fake. Uh, it can sometimes have heroin in it uh, to fake some of the high um, and so on. So, but it is the same process, but not the same laboratory. Right. Let me say something about so, hallucinogens. Question? Yeah. Uh, so I had watched a Vice video, right, about the process of making cocaine. And I do know that they use, like, battery acid and sometimes gasoline. Yeah, so, kerosene and yeah, spit. Humans saliva from human spit. Sorry. Is that the same as a medical level, too? Like, they have the same ingredients, same process? Not exactly. It's a much more uh, scientifically done, but it's the okay. chemistry. There's a lot of... Um, you have to make it a more pure, to, to sell it as a pharmaceutical, it has to be purified without any other uh, in, things mixed in. When they do that, like those clandestine ones, like say in South America where they're extracting it, um, it doesn't matter if there's still kerosene in the final product because it's not going through a regulatory process. So it's like the buyer beware. Some of you guys like use um, marijuana, um, the concentrates. When you use marijuana concentrates, uh, why can't they get the word? Um, like, what's the what's the street name? Um, CBD. No, like the actual. If you went to a dispensary, um, and you bought the concentrated, like wax. flour, wax, wow. like wax and sh shatter, right? Yeah, that's concentrated. Shatter. They have different kinds. Yeah, that's like the concentrated form of it. They've extracted the the, t the cannabinoids from the flour, and then they. Yeah. Purified it and purified it, concentrated and concentrated. That's what they call like wax or um, what? Crumble, shatter. There you go, yeah. crumble, shatter. Uh, when you get into that level of, of concentration, again, we will expect addiction rates to go up. We'll expect more side effects. But the reason why we wanted California wanted to make it, it's illegal in California because the feds say it's illegal. But the reason we wanted to kind of legalize it was because, for example, when you extract those cannabinoids from the flower, you have to either use carbon dioxide or butane or some of these other molecules. And what happens is if you just buy it from the local dealer, that, that oil could still have butane in it. It could still have propane in it, which is actually quite bad for you. Mm -hmm. But if it eventually has to be sold in a more legal setting, then it has to go through, or some of it has to at least get tested, or it has yeah. to go to a warehouse and they have to go, Oh, there's no butane in here, or you know, there's no harm, there's no heavy metals, or, or other things that, that could have been in it. I actually have a friend whose uh, families are growers up in uh, the Mendocino area, uh -huh. and uh, she's not a grower. She ended up in going into the military and, and uh, as a veteran and whatnot. But she has family members that are growers, and one of the things that uh, a family member was upset about when they went, uh, and I'm saying legal because it's totally illegal, but in California, she had a family member who was pissed off because he had been growing and selling marijuana for years and years and years well in the illegal trade and then he had to have it go get tested and it came back with heavy metals Turns oh. out the valley that he was growing it in had been contaminated with heavy metals from some world war sometime when they were dumping oh my it. gosh and he was really really mad that he couldn't sell his weed anymore yeah that's a lot of product to go to waste but the point being he had been selling it all those years <laughs> because we weren't testing because it was completely illegal. So there's no testing, right? right? Yeah. So he had to go get it tested and he found out he was selling stuff that. Yeah. And he had to dispose of it. The state made him dispose of it. Oh my gosh. That's a lot of money. <laughs> I know, but I've never heard of somebody who's stoned robbing a bank. Right. No. Mm -hmm. So, but we need to regulate it. So when people talk about the legalization, when people are like, maybe going to be harmed by it, it doesn't mean that it's not harmful. It can be harmful. Right? It can cause cancer, it can cause things. But we want to mitigate harm. 
So I'm going to do the drug, maybe. There's harm, but what if there's uh, mold spores in it? What if there's heavy metals in it? What if there's things that can do me extra harm that I'm right. not even aware of? And that's what we want to regulate. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's safe. It just means that we're trying to make it, like when you buy a food in the grocery store and there's a food label, you could be, and let's say I'm allergic to wheat, and it says this does not contain wheat. Right. I'm pretty sure that I can eat it. But if I go and get shady. wheat, then it's like, oh, maybe there's heavy metal. Right. But if it's tested, it looks less shady. You're going to like, it doesn't look like you want to buy something that doesn't even have like any product label or what's in it. And you don't know if it's been tested, if it's legit, you, you don't know like what it is. Right. And so and that's why California that that. and a lot of other states, like, we've decided people are going to be doing this stuff. We should regulate it. Like, like any other food product right? or yeah. any other, you can't just sell anything anywhere at any time. Like there's regulations for even water. Right, well, yeah, so, it can't be considered legal if it's basically under the table and nobody knows what's really in it, what's going on. That, that's technically still illegal. Like, <laughs> Right. I have friends that are working in the labs that they analyze the marijuana for the different levels. And one of the things they have to do a microscopic evaluation where they have to look for, no joke, um, insect feces and mm -hmm. like, things like that. Because the stuff that you're probably getting from your friend, maybe they're an awesome grower or maybe it was like, who knows? And also pesticides. Oh yeah, you fertilizers. Have... They were using fertilizers that weren't made for human consumption. Right. Yeah. So and they would spray plants with pesticides like crazy. When they would get bugs on them, they would spray them with pesticides, and you could taste it. Like you could definitely taste it if you were to and smoke. Then, who knows what the carcinogenic effect of that is? Who knows yeah. what the teratogenic? When you guys look at the alcohol video, who knows what the teratogenic effects of those molecules? Yeah. Are? We don't know. Yeah. Pesticides have been linked to autism. Yeah. So we don't know. Um, and now with hallucinogens, this is just the one thing that I want to say is they cause what they call a misperception in the way you see the world. And so I want to explain a little bit about what a misperception is uh, first. So um, oops, my thing is going crazy. So I just want to show you like how we actually uh, perceive things. So let's say I have my, my brain up here and my little eyeball, I don't know. <laughs> the eyeball, the cerebellum and everything. Okay. And I have a hand here. And let's say I put a really sharp object, right? Uh, either my hand, right? Where I can just, I know that's a horrible looking hand. But I can put my hand down, right, and out, right? So in order for me to, to actually have the ouch sensation, the ouch perception, what will have to happen is I have to have a sensory neuron in my skin, and it has to be able to detect the sharpness. So if, I don't, if I'm born without these receptors, I can't feel anything. So I have to be born with the right receptor. And then this neuron will travel into the brain, usually the spinal cord even. It'll travel into the spinal cord and it delivers its message. And with a reflex, the spinal cord will deliver a message back, you know, that says, you know, pull your hand away. And when they saw, we saw the reflex really well in the video, in the nerves at work video, where they showed that reflex. That's why it's called a reflection and reflects back the signal. But here's what happens when the signal, when the sensory signal is traveling in, when the action potential is traveling down this neuron and it's actually traveling like into your CNS, you cannot feel that. You, you have no conscious, the only place you can feel is up in your cerebrum where you have conscious awareness. If you can't be aware of it, you can't feel it, okay? So these signals that are traveling in and on my neurons, you know, the, the signal is traveling in, the signal is traveling out. I don't feel that. Now, if this signal is something that the brain needs to be alerted to, in the cerebellum and everything, it'll send the signal on another neuron. It'll send that signal up. Let me get a darker color. 
there'll be another neuron and that neuron will go up and it'll deliver the news to your cerebrum. And when it arrives in your cerebrum, your cerebrum will interpret that, right? With spatial summation and temporal summation and the pattern of which it's arriving in the brain, it'll make an interpretation of what that means. And it might say, ow, your hand just got hurt. And you look, just right, remember you pull it away and then you look, you're ow, right? Ow, you say ow, I mean, it'll send a signal over your mouth. So you say ow. <laughs> So other people are alerted around you that you might have been hurt. Now, only when it gets up, when you are aware of it, your brain interprets it, and now you're aware of it. That's what we call a perception. The brain can make a mistake, and it can form what we call a misperception. Hallucinogens... Gen there means generator. Uh, hallucin hallucinations mean something like you don't see, maybe you don't something you don't hear, something you don't see, something's not this. You're perceiving something that's not really there, or you're perceiving it in a different way. So what happens with these hallucinogens is you, all your circuitry is working. Your sensory neurons are working. Your motor neurons are working. Your cerebrum's working. Everything's working. And let's say like this is an actual example that happened to me when I was a kid. Um, one of my best friends, um, unknown to me, took a hallucinogen and then walked to my house and showed up at my house. I didn't know that they were, it was LSD or PCP that I don't recall. And they were acting really weird and they were kind of strange and I didn't want my parents to get weird out or whatever it is. So I was like, let's go for a walk. And it was sun was setting. It was like Sunday afternoon and our, it was like, like before Monday school. And I was like, let's just walk around the neighborhood because I was trying to keep her calm. I didn't know what was wrong with her. And we, we were walking in, my na in the neighborhood and everybody had a driveway. And, and we got to the end of each driveway and she would stop and like throw her arms up and she would go, Look at the gnome. And uh, what gnome? Don't you see it? Don't you see the gnome? Names have been changed to protect the innocent. I don't know, Mary. I don't, I don't see the gnome. Come on, let's just keep walking, trying to distract. Get to the next, walk like 10 feet, get to the next driveway. <laughs> see the gnome? I'm like, I don't see the gnome. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, I don't know. Hours go by, we eventually go home and go to sleep. I never could figure out what was going on. The next morning, I found out she had taken the drugs. And next morning, I w went outside and I realized what had happened in my neighborhood. This was nowadays you have the trucks that come and they mechanically pick up the garbage and they dump them. But back then, it was uh, always uh, garbage people in small cans and people would ride on the back of the truck and they would pick up the garbage and physically dump it. And so you had these smaller bins, uh, the same bins that they use like for um, those percussion like stomp and those percussion shows where they're like banging on the lids, like the metal lids, there would be these small garbage pans, pails, and then they would have uh, these little metal lids. Oh, Oscar the Grouch. The, the cans that Oscar the Grouch sits in in um, Sesame Street. You know Oscar. He's green. Oscar the Grouch. So that kind of a wastebasket, they were small. Well, anyways, she was on LSD. So what happened was, so there was a wastebasket there. And it turns out the trash was picked up on Monday morning. So what happened was as the evening was going by, people were taking their trash out. So as we're doing on our walk, more and more people were putting their trash at the end of their driveway. So the delivery, the delivery, so the pickup trucks could come and get it, right, the next morning. So as we're out walking, and I didn't realize what was going on. So what was happening is, she sees these uh, garbage bales, right? Her eye sees the garbage bale, and that sends a sensory signal that begins traveling into the brain. Right, so she's, sensory signals are traveling in, traveling in, gets to her brain, it gets passed to the part of your brain when you interpret visual information, which is actually the back of your cerebrum. And uh, as the signal gets transferred back there, instead of her brain, all the anatomy was correct but she was under the influence of the drug. 
and that the drug causes a misperception. So what will happen was when that signal arrives and that the pattern distributed on the back of her brain, instead of seeing garbage pails, her brain went garden gnome. Are you guys like garden gnomes? Like, was it Travelocity has like that gnome? <laughs> like the gnome, that's what she, and I was like, so it was the next day, that's when I realized that the garden gnome, that's what she was seeing. Like somehow in her brain, this was like a person, like a gnome. I guess maybe like Oscar the Grouch, huh? like a little, with a beard and, and she thought he was a garden gnome. Which don't exist, they're like mythical creatures, I think. I failed mythology, but I'm pretty sure they don't exist and they're some kind of mythical creature. Isn't there a movie about the gnome? I don't know. I'm sure lots of movies. Uh, you know who's a gnome? Santa Claus. The elves are gnomes, I think. No way. I'm sorry. Some of you, Santa Claus absolutely exists and there could be children watching. And I know, no, 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 no. I know. And he's a Trust gnome. If my daughters are here. It would, we still do the whole Santa Claus thing with yeah, them. Yeah, so I'm not gonna assume we don't, we're, we're remote learning, so Santa's a gnome. <laughs> No, they're not here. <laughs> I don't want to ruin that, but in your house, no, you might have a little brother in someone else's house right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, and they would be like, no, Santa, that Santa's a gnome. Okay. Um, that's hallucinogens. This is what they cause is misperceptions. It's very rare for it to cause a misperception. Like you can have a visual misperception, a little more rare. You can have an auditory uh, misperception. Those are more common. Like you just, you have like a thought. And actually, usually uh, most hallucinations are, are more like just a thought. Like you just think something is real. And even though it's not real, like I told you guys, I had a friend that had the mild hallucination that made, she had a thought. I can fly. It is a hallucination. She thought she could fly, but because she thought she could fly, she tested the idea and jumped out the second story window, not trying to kill herself. Thankfully, she's alive today, uh, but uh, she didn't die. Uh, but those are hallucinations, and marijuana is a hallucinogen, uh, and it causes the most common hallucinations that marijuana causes. It can cause changes in thought, but it most often changes in um, our perception. Again, it's causing a misperception in the passage of time, right? How, how is time passing? Is time passing slowly? Is time passing quickly? And we know that we can get into those misperceptions, get into the zone and you can do like a ton of work in a small amount of time. And that's sort of like a hallucination, I guess, but if this, if it's caused by a drug induced, right? That would be a hallucination. That's the most common is a time, time misperception, a loss of, lost track of time. Um, you can have things like where you can hear a color. That's actually called synesthesia, which is not the same as anesthesia. So anesthesia is having to do with feeling, right? Anesthesia is without feeling. And synesthesia means, sin means the connecting with, and it's basically things are connecting in a weird way. You're, you're experiencing feelings, anesthesia. You're experiencing feelings in a weird way. So for example, um, you might see a color, and some of you can be born with synesthesia. You, you, some of us are born with synesthesia. It's not induced by a drug. Some of us will take the drug and it can produce synesthesia in someone who's not born that way. But some of you in this class, you may have synesthesia, whether you're aware of it or not. And what people who have synesthesia, uh, every color has a sound. So when they see the color, they also hear a sound. And a lot of musicians um, are synesthetics. You can hear color. You can also, um, if you're a synesthetic, you can also see 
sound. So every single sound has a unique shape or a unique color or a unique pattern that when you hear it, you hear it, but simultaneously you also see it. You're hearing and seeing it at the same time. Most of us only hear sound, okay? Uh, but synesthetics can, it's, there's some like crossing over. They see sound, they hear colors. Um, a lot of musicians, a lot of artists in history turn out to be natural, not, not drug induced, but they were born that way. They're natural synesthetics. Um, some people say uh, Beethoven was a synesthetic and he would actually be able to see all the music dancing in front of him as he was composing it. How do you get synesthesia then? You're born with it. Otherwise, some hallucinogens. <laughs> I can't spell it all of a sudden. Asking for a friend. I'm just kidding. There we go. Some hallucinogens will cause a type of synesthesia. It, it may not be the same as what people are naturally born with, but it seems to cause like, it seems to mimic it. And um, I actually had an experience where I experienced synesthesia uh, from a drug. Uh, I actually didn't take the drug on purpose. Somebody, um, this is something I want to say as we finish up. Somebody slipped me the drug. It had been dead in the last whatever. If you don't know about like Me Too movements and you don't give people things without them knowing, right? You don't slip, whether you're trying to rape them. This wasn't a rape drug, but it doesn't matter. Like you don't alter someone's consciousness and take away their ability to function without their consent, right? Without their knowledge. So if you go up to me and you say, hey, would you like some LSD? I should have the option, just like, I should be able to say, yes, I want it, or no, I don't want it. And even if I say, yes, I want it, if I change my mind at the last second and I don't want to take the LSD, it couldn't be like, well, we've already got the LSD, so now you've got to take it, right? We all know that's a bit strange. So the idea that someone could, could just slip it into your food and, and basically dose you with it without your consent. Um, first of all, that is assault and battery. And if you wanted to, you could prosecute them to the full extent of the law. It's also extremely dangerous because the person taking it doesn't know they've taken it. Um, and that happened to me. Um, and long story short, I was a senior in high school when I was running a Battle of the Bands concert, and my high school had 5,000 students, as I've mentioned, and we had a lot of bands, including non-high school bands that were coming for this thing. We had an auditorium that held thousands of people, and I had hired, I was in charge of the entire event, from the cops all the way down to the bottom, and ticket sales and everything, advertising, promotions, everything, and it was the day of the event, and somebody dosed me because I guess they thought it would be funny, ha ha ha. And I didn't know that I'd been dosed, uh, but initially I do remember like the second band was on and that's when I realized something. I thought I actually had a brain tumor at first, something was really wrong because actually that's what happened. I was in the, I was just off stage and I was looking out into the auditorium and um, the band was playing and I saw the music in the air, like, shooting through the room. I could see the music. And um, it was not pleasant. It freaked me out. I didn't know that I'd been dosed. So I thought I was either lost my mind or I had a tumor or I was going crazy. Um, it was a really awful experience. Um, I survived though. And I just have to say, never, ever, 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 ever slip someone a drug. Do you know what you were dosed with? Pardon? Do you know what you were dosed with? I believe I was dosed. Uh, I, with PCP from what I, uh, you know, I didn't confront the person. I didn't know who had done it. And I, so I didn't actually confront the person for almost 25 years later because I didn't know who had done it. But when Facebook came out and everybody was connecting up for the first time, I had a friend that was like, dude, I got dosed. I was over at the community college and I got dosed and something. And I was like, well, who were you with when that happened? Turns out it was the same person I was with senior year. And then they were with them a few months later at community college and they got dosed. So that's how I figured out who had done it. And that's also how I figured out what, what had been done, or what I had been given. Did you tell them anything? Or no? I contacted them on Facebook and told them that they were a-holes. And <laughs> what they had done to me. And it wasn't funny. So, And the guy that had been dosed, my friend that got dosed, he didn't know, he was sitting in class 
and it, when it came on, he was in a he was an engineering student. And he was sitting in class, and he said he got this idea that there were giant bugs, and they were all like gonna be. He saw giant bugs too. He said, and and like like the size of houses, and he decided he just left the class. He just walked out of the room, and he got in his car, and then and then he said he was driving his car. Think how dangerous this is. He's driving his car, and then he said. One of the giant bugs um, ate him. And 10 hours later, it puked him out on his friend's lawn, and that's where he woke up on his friend's lawn. And to this day, he thinks that a giant bug ate him and carried him around in his belly and then puked him out 10 hours later on his friend's lawn. He does not never know, he never knew what happened to his car. Don't those people, who knows, he could have hit somebody. Thankfully, his cerebellum was driving, I guess. That's right. Um, I that. But lack of drug education. So mom would just say no. So there was absolutely, there was no drug education. So you didn't know that it was stupid. I, I imagine they knew it was stupid, but they probably just thought it was funny. You know, I don't know what they thought. Um, they apologized. What it's worth. Um, you know. Um, that probably is a place to stop. And let me... And we got questions. Can you pass the screenshots like in like in the in the order, please? Yes, from today. Yes. Let me do that. Let me go back to screen share. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, a lot of people so tell me they really like that. And in the regular classroom, like before when I first started using this whiteboard, this electronic whiteboard, I started doing that because they didn't have videos, obviously. <laughs> So it was really helpful. So there's our first slide for looking at cocaine. And again, this is comparing a little bit to the way that, that tobacco got changed from this acid form, alkaline form to make it, whether it went across the mucosa or whether you could inhale it. There's a similar piece of knowledge there. Oh, and um, Professor, um, you, when I'm on the blackboard and I'm looking at the syllabus and then there's a a different I'll one where advancing talk as you're talking. I'll keep advancing as you're talking. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. Um, the <clears throat> excuse me. It has. Hold on. Let me look at it because like one of them, like I think it says the notes. Like doesn't it have like the different year. Like it's kind of in there, isn't it? So like it's like kind of ass backwards. Hold on. Let me, I'll pull it up right now. Okay. Oh, me. So I have one question. Yes. Well, is the finance time next class? Yes. Okay. Thursday, I'll do the same thing. I'll do a 9.05. I'll be in the Zoom room um, in case you run into any questions or problems or whatever. I found that's been really, really useful. Um, that way you don't have the stress of the weekend and wondering what, what's happening, especially with the last exam. And, uh, and then at about 10.45, I imagine everybody will be done. Um, if not, I'll be out of the Zoom room. Uh, and uh, I've actually got an elderly uh, relative that uh, we're being at the States allowing us to go visit for the first time on Thursday. So I've got an appointment at 1045 to meet outside of the of assisted living facility so that I can uh, meet my relative for the first time in months. So I'm doing that on Thursday. So I definitely won't be hanging in the Zoom room late. My appointment's at 245 and I got to get there early so they can take temperatures and get us all set up outside six feet apart and all that. Um, and, but that's Thursday. And it'll cover, again, what we've been doing since our last exam, which normally would have been like a month's worth of material. It's just under this compression. It just, it's been flying at you. So. Also, the la um, the last class, the are, gonna, are they in the, um, did you guys have reviewed the, the screenshots too, or no? Ask it one more time. Like, for example, last class, did you, are you going to do it, is that included in the test? Yes, last class definitely the test. So I can run through those again too. This is getting through today's. Let's see. Some people are taking pictures. Other people are just boarding here. Actually, how's to have a question? Sure. Um, when I was going through Canvas to look at the um, like the outline notes. I couldn't find the one for uh, alcohol. 
Oh, that's because I stuck it right at the start of the alcohol video. Oh, okay. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, project that too over here. And that okay. might help uh, Matt or someone that's having trouble too. Um, no, actually, no. Yo, Gix, I want to know. Da, da, da. With the Breath of Life, I watched that and I wasn't able to um, uh, write on it after or anything like that. No, you have to do it on a separate piece of paper, and then you'll just take a screenshot of that paper, and that's what you put into the the thing. Let me do a stop share here. Well, let me get the. I didn't stop sharing. Let me pull up. Uh, the right thing. Yeah, that. I gotta go back to share. I guess that's screen one. Okay, so the alcohol chapter. So it's right here. So. We get into unit four, alcohol. I stuck it right at the beginning. So there it is, alcohol. That's the lecture outline. I forget who just asked me that. Was it Arturo, Tony? I forget. No, um, it was me. <laughs> like, I, and I don't even have my, my window up. So, right, so there's that's the alcohol lecture. And then it reminds you, like, that's chapter three of the orange book. So I, I sort of stuck that in there. And I put it right uh, at the start. It's not on screen sharing. I couldn't. Oh, it's not screen sharing. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to hit share. And then <laughs> I have to click share and then I have to click it a second time and I forgot to click the second time. But now I'm gonna turn red because that was embarrassing. Okay, but uh, so let me go back. <laughs> All right, so we come in and we get la 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 all the way down. So here we go. Drug studies, alcohol, and so I put it right at the start. So, and then there's the two videos on alcohol. So if you click on there, it'll bring up your lecture outline. If you want to like split screen it or something and then, and then go to the next, then you'll have the video. So if you want the lecture outline up while you're watching the video, there's a part one of the video then part two of the video. Um, and I know I didn't cover absolutely everything, but I hopefully I covered uh, enough to get you guys through this content. And then most of you guys have all turned in your homeworks, but a few of you that are still Matt, in particular. Yes, no, I know. And, well, we got added on time, but with a short semester, it didn't leave you much time to turn these in. Let me okay. show you, for example, when you do um, Breath of Life, for example. So I don't know if you can see this. Let me make it bigger. The symbol, when it has this little pencil here, yes. that means it's an actual assignment where you, you'll, there'll be this, the portal window where you can submit it. When it just has without the pencil, that's sort of just like the page, the content. So when you click on this one, it brings you into the video and it tells you watch the video, uh, do, do the interpretive questions and the interpretive questions are here at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I did that. And then, so then once you've done that, then, and I'm not in student view, so it's gonna look a little different. The next time we go a little smaller here too. Then this is the Breath of Life video in here. If I was in student view, it would then, there would be the submission window right here. It would allow you to submit it. It would have like up, upload, file, direct in the window. Let me see if I can. See, that's where I, it was, cause it was trying to say upload, but then I was having a hard time being able to write on there. So I just looked at them. So I wrote, I wrote them down, the answers. You could write them right in the window. That's one of the options. Well, let me see if it'll let me go to student view. Yeah, it's where we don't want class. Feather, right? And let me go. It wouldn't let me write in there. Modules. I don't know if it'll let me because I'm like not necessarily a student. It'll give me student view. But I don't know if it'll give me. Where'd that go? Oh, not too far. Ah, nervous. Professor. Yes. Are we done with class already? Yeah, you're done. You can go. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Good thank luck. you, Professor. Have a good day. You're, you're welcome. I'll thank see you tomorrow. If you have any questions? Yeah, thank you for everything, Professor. Yeah, see, see here, um, Matt, where it says submit assignment? You click on that. Can you see that blue button? So I, I clicked on Breath of Life, and it's reminding you there's the video in case you want to watch it again. You're going to submit your answers to the recall and the interpretive questions. And there's the button right here. It says submit assignment. You click on that button. And then it brings you up this. So you can upload a file where you 
if it's already in your computer, you go uh, add a file, you'll choose file, and it, it gives you feel like, you know, you can browse and find what file you want to upload it, but you had typed it, let's say, in another thing. You can do text entry, which means you can type right in this window. Okay. That's where I was having a hard time because or I... if you yeah. have it in Google Drive, you can bring it in from Google Drive. If you have it in Microsoft, so there, you have all of those options. I tried to leave it open uh, so that uh, whatever way worked for people, they could do it. I know most uh, online teachers require just a specific way for you to learn. I just at this point wanted people just whatever kind of computer they were working on and whatever worked. Ah, someone's got their hand up. So yeah, Gabriella. Oh, do you want to take them again? You mean the screenshots of the notes again? I've seen. And what's Gabrielle's hand up for? Let me leave student view. Let me stop sharing so I can see what's going on in my thing. Where's Gabriella? Hey, Gabrielle, can you talk? Oh, you lowered hand. I think it says Miriam and I and uh, Dr. Shapiro. Gabriella. Maybe not. So did everybody that wanted to take their screenshot get their screenshot? I'm going to do stop recording.